This is Chronic Curiosity. We are sitting down with Steve Naughton. He is the owner of Primal Fitness Gym and Primal Fitness Supplements in Worcester, Ohio. Uh, he can be found at superhero underscore Steve on Facebook and Instagram and at primalfitnessworcester.com. Enjoy. All right. You ready? I'm ready whenever you are. All right. Well, here we go. Steve Naughton. Hello. Hello, he says. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, I was going to introduce you, um, but I, I made the mistake last time the, when we had to talk with Mike Manchek, mm -hmm. and I made the mistake of putting him in a box, and I didn't intend to do that. And I don't know if he really felt like that. Um, but just in my mind afterwards, I was like, I kind of feel like I kind of pigeonholed him, if that's the right term. So I'm just going to put you on the spot. And who is Steve Naughton? Yikes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know there's, there's a lot to, I feel like there's a lot to unpack. So you, you can unpack it as you will. Well, I mean, what, everybody, what? everybody has a lot to unpack, right? right? I mean, we're all an onion. And I always tell, like, when I interact with people, especially people that I'm, speaking with or even just meeting for the first time i i, I can get into it. i met a gentleman last night at, at football practice and he i just told him i'm like you know everybody has a story it's just a matter of people willing to listen everybody has a story right like even if you think you're the most boring person in the world there's always something about you that's that's interesting to somebody else and then that builds a story and then that's how you kind of get on the same page you know and start to have you know commonalities and that's when you build relationship um well, I'll start I, I, when I when I talk to people and like I've, I've done interviews and stuff like that before, but I, I see a common issue with people that they don't ever say like who their parents are. They never say, oh, you, well, you know, my name's Steve, but you know, my mom and dad, like my mom and dad are Lisa and Ken Naughton. They're from Parma, Ohio. And... Getting the lineage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like, nice to meet you, my liege. I'm Steve. I hail from Parma. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, I just, I just feel like it's a lost art um, because... And I've, I've heard your podcast before and, and others as well. You know, we, we come from the foundation of family and that's where we learn everything, you know, in the, in the home, at least at a very young age. And then obviously you start to get put into a social setting and that's when it starts to shape and mold you and your understanding of the world. It's when the but, hurricane hits you. <laughs> yeah. But, but then, but, but then your, your mom and dad are there as like the rescue, you know what I mean? They're kind of trying to guide you, um, in, in a sense. So. Yeah, I'll start. I'll honestly, I'll just start with my parents because that's the people who I, who I try to emulate as much as I can. You know, my mother and father. Um, you know, people change as we go on. You know, and I've seen different phases of of my parents. You know what I mean? My my mom working an endless amount of jobs to support us. So she was in the restaurant industry, so she'd been in the restaurant industry for her whole life. Um, working crazy hours. You know, working. You know, getting two three hours of sleep, waking up with us, taking us to school, taking care of the kids. Um, my dad w was pretty much the breadwinner, you know, going to, had the consistent, you know, nine to five job. He worked at, um, Cleveland time clock, which was the old time clock company, you know, the, you know, oh, okay. yeah, you're, yeah, you're in and out. <laughs> the actual, so, yeah, they he, just make the time they yeah, just make the clock. Like, what is yeah. He was actually a technician. So he would actually, uh, service the actual time clocks that people that these companies would buy right oh man it's almost like, like you don't even think about that yeah anymore. well you it's know even, and like even a... as a kid you know i remember if i if i took the day off school or whatever or if dad would be like hey do you want to come to the shop with me and like everyone's like oh, i gotta go to work with dad or unless your dad had a really cool job but like i tell my friends you know and stuff like oh yeah my dad was a, a time clock technician they're like oh that sounds really cool <laughs> sweet <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but it was fun though because um I'm naturally a social guy and I was a social kid, man. I, my, my parents always had friends over. We had parties all the time. And I was, I was literally right there, like right in the middle with everybody. And they're like, who's this eight year old kid? <laughs> just like running around and being like, hello, sir. Hello, man. What do you do for a You sound like my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The one person like yeah, as exactly when she's it. leaving yeah. stores, she'll yeah. be like, thanks a lot, Stacy. And yeah. she'll be like, what? 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 Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's funny because, you know, I learned that from a young age. Um, just engaging with adults. So I grew up really quickly and I was totally separated as a child, you know, from, from the social group for that reason. 
you know what I mean? Just the amount of respect that I, that the respect that my parents instilled to me to give respect to not just elders, but just like the, the general human being. Right. Now, are you, you an only I mean? child or? No, no. I have, okay, a, so I have a brother and a sister and, okay. and a, a stepsister. Six, that sounds yeah. like a, lot, a very lo- only child type. Mm-mm. No, no, definitely had, uh, definitely had siblings in the mix. Um, yeah. So kind of rolling into that. So I have a older brother, Brian, um, who's a huge influence in my life as well. And, um, and then I have an uh, older sister, Monica, um, which she has her own story as well, too. So um, I feel like we should kind of cover why you brought me onto this podcast, what really kind of sp- sparked it. Yeah. So I feel so, like this would be a good start. Okay. Like, yeah. Like Steve Day Zero. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how that, <laughs> we could do how, the, how that happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, obviously, we met at your gym that you own yeah. here yes. in, in yes. town, yeah. um, Primal Fitness. Yes. Um, so that was obviously the 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 starting point and mm-hmm. then i just i as i began to understand more mm-hmm. about or learn more about you as it were um and this kind of all developed kind of around the same time as when me we met and so when we, i started doing this right so then as it just kind of developed i was like oh like as i just heard like bullet points of who steve was it was like oh this dude's got a story we, I, we need to i yeah. need to get to know this guy like we need and then it was like well Oh, I might as well have him on the podcast too. Yeah, like, yeah. They, I, good plus. Sounds like you got some stories, but so, I, from my understanding, obviously, from from what I know, you grew up in Ohio, right? But then traveled the world, as it were, yep. literally, yep. and then came to Worcester. Correct. So maybe ground zero of what brought you to our intersection. To yeah. owning that gym in yeah. Worcester. Yeah, and it literally goes back to day zero, <laughs> 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 which is funny uh, because most people just kind of tell their story from like sixty percent on, and then we kind of wonder like what was the what was the impetus for that? You know what I mean? Right. Like what what actually brought us to that point? Um, so, my family, starting as far back as 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 far as we know, and I haven't we haven't done genetic testing or anything, but. As far as we know, my I bet that makes you nervous. Great, we can get gran- into that later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, great, great grandparents. Um, we assess, at least, and from the research that I've done and the research that our family has done, that um, there's a genetic um, mutation that happens somewhere in our lineage. Right. Um, so what happened is, is the uh, the X chromosome that obviously was carried by one of our family members um, had a genetic mutation in it, and and I know Aunt is might be familiar with this. Um, it's known as uh, SCIDS, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency. It's also known as boy-in-the-bubble disease. True. So boy-in-the-bubble disease, a lot of people might remember you know, a John Travolta movie back in like the 80s or 90s. Um, it was a play on the, the, the genetic disease that our right. family carries. And he's like in this big bubble, and he's like trying to get in the like school bus. And it's like, <laughs> right. it's like, well, what's wrong with him? Well, he was born without an immune system. That's right. what, what happens. The genetic, the genetic code basically says... In the body, you know, for all those uh, nursing and doctor nerds out there, and even just the lamest person, um, B and T cells are pretty much what makes up your immune system, right? It gives you immunity and, of course, a bunch of other things, but B and T cells are really what help create immunity in the body. Well, my body didn't have the ability to do that. Same with um, my grandmother's boys. She had three boys who passed away at birth because they did not know what it was back then right because that'd been that had been what i mean early yeah it was like, um i don't even like want to throw mid 1900s or something like that yeah well it wouldn't be mid yeah more late could, later, later. well i guess your parents 60s 70s 80s they would have been your yeah. uncles or oh, aunts. C- correct okay. correct yeah so I did have an uncle who survived but i have i have uh, a ton of aunts and one uncle um so uh but during that time you know during the baby boom and especially in the you know the 50s 60s and 70s you know Kids were happening all over the place, man. <laughs> Popping out everywhere. Yeah, we have a huge family. Sometimes I forget how many aunts and uncles I had. I think I had, I don't know, six or seven aunts and one uncle. <clears throat> Sorry if I forgot one in there or added one that I yeah. don't know about. I'm sure they probably won't listen to this quite yet, anyway. So nah, well, send out invites. Maybe it depends. I don't know how close you are to yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we are. We're very close. Oh, to the okay. Family. Well, maybe they will listen yeah. to it. Who knows? Um, but yeah, so that happened in our family, and and we were very cognizant of it, and. When I was born, it was actually started with my cousins. When, when my cousin was born, you know, something just didn't seem right. Um, 
babies were acting weird. Um, my mom, I always kid with my mom about this and she's probably going to watch this and probably hear it. Um, she's going to be like, I didn't say that. <laughs> that's, that's not <laughs> but, how it went. Yeah, that's not how it went. <laughs> but she tells me all the time when I came out, there was something wrong with me. She's like, she's like, just literally just looking at me. And she's like, there was something wrong with me. And she tried telling the doctors and the nurses that she's like, if something just does not feel right. So what ended up happening was, um, they got genetic testing done and they found, found out they're like, Oh, no kidding. You know, you actually, you guys carry this disease in, in your genetics. Uh, Steve needs a bone marrow transplant to help be rebuild his body. Jesus, and pretty brutal for a newborn to yeah, throw that out there. Yeah, because I'm sitting there like, oh, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, come on, Doc. Come on, man. <laughs> I'm like, I came out. I just, I just breathed there for the first time. You're telling me I, I got to go live in a tube? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, for the first weeks of life, um, the way I remember it <laughs> is, uh, I was, uh, I was basically kept in a in a capsule to make sure that I was safe. No germ could touch me. The simplest of germs could kill you. Right. You have no immune system. You have no defenses. You know, all the fen no, no fences are up. Yeah, we forget how, how much it do our body yeah. really does for us. Huh? Absolutely, yeah. And it makes you appreciate life at that level, which obviously as I grew older, I started to gain more and more appreciation f for life in general. So so what, what the very unique thing that happened was, and I, like I said, my sister has her own story, is my sister is six, seven years older than me-ish. So at that time, uh, getting a bone marrow transplant meant you have to have such a close match for that for your bone marrow to be accepted into your body for your body to be able to regenerate on its own gotcha. that they you know they need to make sure that it's it's on point so um we had some of the best doctors at rainbow babies and children's hospitals get together and say okay you know we need to figure this out well when they did testing on my sister even though she's six years older seven years older than me she had more of a match than what they had seen in twins biological twins. wow yeah that's lucky. Yeah. amazing amazing Jack, jackpot for you <laughs> yeah no yeah. kidding right so the the doctor always told us um you know it's not a matter of you got two blessings the, the one is that monica was born first and that stephen was born second because if it were the other way around you know it, it very well may not have been you know we may not have been as lucky with the bone marrow transplant so after the bone marrow transplant got that at eight weeks old for a large majority of the first few years of life, and this is why I, this is why I focus so much on my parents, is for the first few months of life, every single day, twice a day, they had to bleach up and down the room that I stayed in after I was able to come home. Every day. Imagine that. It's a lot of work. I mean, a, it's a, a lot of love. Yeah, and, and it, you know, taking and, care of a, yep. a new child is yeah. you know, stressful, stressful enough. enough. We had a dog yeah. at the time that we had to get rid of. They had Brian and Monica, my brother and sister, who were Just going nose back. pickers. Yep, going back. Yeah, dude. Like, <laughs> what do you guys? Do? Why? What, <laughs> yeah. what makes you guys special? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, you know, going back and forth to Grandma's house, always concerned. You know, oh my God, is Steve get it? Get sick? The endless trips back and forth to the hospital. Um, money was tight. I mean, geez, I told you my mom was in the restaurant industry. Newsflash, you're not going to make that much money. My dad right. was a time clock technician. You know, he's not, he's not a CEO. He wasn't an accountant for any big corporation or anything like right. that. You know, we we're very, very much so a middle, if not lower middle class family that was dealing with something that was extremely difficult. Um, so that pretty much started the foundation. And even when I went into elementary school, um, the fear was always there. Like, oh, uh, you know, they call the schools back then because they didn't have email or Facebook or whatever. Right. Call the, call the families. They leave a message on the, internet on the tape recorder. Yeah, there wasn't even internet. You, you um, mean the good old times? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, this... Got that right, man. Um, yeah. So, but every time that phone would ring and they'd see, you know, Hannah Elementary. Right. Like, shoot. And they'd be like, oh, you know, well, there's a cold going around, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like consistent fear. You know what I mean? Like, what's going to happen? Like the principal knew who I was. They, they knew they had to watch after me. It's right. like everyone just sees school just as it is. But, you know, we have, you have administrators and teachers and all the people that are wrapped up in that whole, that whole equation do so much. You know, the nurse at the school, right. all those people. Especially you know. when they care. Yeah. They oh, and care. they did. Yeah. You know I, have I, mean? I come from it's... a wonderful school system, Parma City Schools. I mean, you can... You can bash, um, you know, public schools all you want, but um, we, Parma City Schools, at least when I went through, and things, times have definitely changed, but man, did we have the most stellar teachers, the most stellar administrators. It was, it was a phenomenal experience because, not just for me, but 
for my family and for the community in general. So, so growing up, you know, I just, I never really knew that there was something wrong with me. You know what I mean? It's not like I was, I was cured. Like by the time I was like two, three, four, you know what I mean? It was like, he's okay. You but know, the concern, that's, what I was, that's what I was wondering, like how, yeah. how much of a concern was there from a medical standpoint yeah. at that point? Well, was from, there, was from a medical standpoint, the only issue, there's, there's side effects. Okay. So um, my cousin and I both get warts really bad. Like we get like warts on our hands, you know what I'm saying? So like, but it's like, there's, what are we going to do about it? You know, I've been to so many doctors and it's like, yeah, HPV, that's the strand and blah, blah, blah and everything like that. It's like, well, that was just a side effect of because well, yeah, because because most yeah. people's immune system, I mean, what well, they say like it's like ninety five percent of the human population has some strand of HPV, HPV but yeah, their immune yeah. system well, typically. Well, how many strands are there? There's like a hundred, oh, hundred, yeah. hundred and thirty five <laughs> yeah, or yeah. something. Yeah. So like, and I've done a stupid amount of research on it. There's so many you'll never be able to cure it. Right. And so that's and they say like most most of it your immune system kicks out. But if you and have, look what happened, right? So I didn't have an immune system. Right. So if you right. even have a even correct somewhat, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, so um. So I always kind of knew that as a kid, like that there was something off and my parents would continually remind me, you know, that everybody, everybody's parents call them a miracle. Well, hopefully they should. Right. Or that, you know, right. you're a good kid and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I've you're seen childbirth for... in person. Yeah. That shit's a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I, I've it's seen amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so it may not be necessarily pretty, yeah. but that's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. So it's like you, you start to have a more of a, a value of life. And, and my parents instilled that to me when I was little. And you know, one of the earliest memories that I have, I remember you were talking about like, what's one of the first things you remember? Uh, right. well, well, the first thing I remember was actually riding a tricycle in my backyard. And I think I was like three or four, maybe five. Five. So mm -hmm. it's like yeah. I'm gonna say you're five. Five. <laughs> yeah. Just no, I I'm don't even know. That, that's how it is. That's how <laughs> foggy it is. You know right. what I mean? Um, but when I was like seven or eight, um, the old school Indian, like the real Indians, like you know Omar Vizquel. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And Shout um, out. and what's his name? <laughs> uh, who is the outfielder? Um, Kenny Lofton. Uh, Kenny Lofton. Yeah. So um, yeah. we got baseballs signed by them and stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. But anyways, uh, the story behind that, we had a. Um, we had been invited by Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital to come to this skids conference, basically. It was like all these kids around the nation who were saved by bone marrow transplants. Like it was like a huge breakthrough in medical history. Um, and I forget the statistics, but we, we were actually featured on a, this is back in the day when VHS was still around too. Um, I still got some floating on the basement, I'm sure. Yeah, man. Some like old skateboarding like are they, are, or something. Are they, re, are they rewound? That is the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably not, because I was an asshole when I was a rewind kid. Rewind it. <laughs> yeah. Come on. We're trying to watch Saving Private Ryan it takes four hours just to rewind it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, we, um, the reason why I say that is because we, we did this interview on PBS, uh, our family. And we had it on VHS and we would watch it all the time. And we went to this conference and um, we had met, I met with the Indians, Omar Vizquel, Kenny oh. Lofton. And it was really cool experience. I got like this little glass plaque that was like rainbow babies, children, survivor and blah, blah, blah. And like, so my parents like instilled that in me young that like, you're, you're here for a reason, man. Right. Like there's you, you have a destiny ahead of you. We don't know what it is yet. I'm not a religious man, but like they, there's something, there's something there. You know what I mean? So just kind of growing up, I, I you kind of let that fall to the wayside, like kind of what I was talking about, like your family's your home base, but then you mm -hmm. kind of let society kind of push you towards whatever they think is going to be good for you, right? Right. So yeah, growing up, I was picked on a lot. I was I was a chubby kid. I was short and fat, and um, you know my my dad would console me a lot because I was so con self conscious about being big, right? And I told him just like. You know, I, I keep getting picked on and uh, kids are making fun of me. And and it really not, not necessarily wasn't the weight issue. Like I had a problem with self-image at that point, the, the weight issue. But my bigger concern was that I took the values and the love that I have for life and for people. And my mistake was bringing that to the elementary school <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i mean i feel like so anything like, like lower than like mm -hmm. it, like what we talked about was like anything below like 25 yeah don't even bother yeah because like, they yeah. just have he's having yeah. no most people haven't got it correct yet. yeah <laughs> they take that and make, turn it around on yeah you. so so i the the deepest respect for women is what was instilled in me and i think that a lot of men that you talk to who have that instilled in them I'm not saying you're a bad person if you didn't learn that when you were little, but there's a lot of really good, just genuinely good men that if you ask them, like, where did you learn your authenticity? Where did you? Most of them will say, well, my 
first of all, my dad beat me <laughs> and he told me, and he yeah, told me, to, yeah. and he told me to respect women. Right. And it's like, there's like, you have to like juxtapose like, okay, people who grow up without a dad, people who grow up without a mom and like how that, how they kind of get shaped into society. But, but the point being of what I'm saying is like, I brought that into society. Me, I'm just like, I'm nice to everybody. I te treat adults with respect. I teach or uh, treat my fellow students with respect. And I just got torn up for that. You know what it I mean? Sounds about right. The biggest thing, <laughs> the biggest thing, oh, well, he's just gay. <laughs> he's nice. He must be gay. I was called gay, I think, until mid high school when I dated my first girlfriend, Nicole, for seven years. <laughs> so, <laughs> six, seven years. And they're like, well, that's just a cover. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's always a. I'm like, oh, that's there's great. A, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, always yeah, a. Great, awesome. But yeah, but I was so, because I was just friendly, man. I just loved people. I love learning about people. I'll go up to the teacher and I'd be like, hey, how are you? How was your night last night? They'd be like, shut up go sit down <laughs> and everyone's like sit down queer and i'm like geez this is this yeah. is rough you know what i mean like and like i said i grew up young and i'm like i talked to my mom and dad i'm like this sucks this is rough like is this really what i have to look forward to yeah well i mean so for you to be able to hold on to that yeah you know because you could have turned yeah, into I, a and, real asshole in, in a minute real in quick. a minute and there was times in my life where i have and because you feel like that is going to be the better way to go and then Right, because it's like, well, fuck you guys then. I'm yeah, be an asshole. exactly. Yeah, it's like, well, that's how you want me to be. And it's like, well, and then you got to reel it back. You know what I'm saying? And, and then you got to stay true to yourself. So so fast forward into middle school, I was like, I, I had friends in private, never in group. Does that make sense? Yeah. I had good friends. I had friends that would come over. We'd play video games. We were fun. We'd laugh. We'd have a good time. Two or three, four, get into a room. No, let's just, let's just pick on Steve. That's how it was. It was very right. much so that group mentality that, you know, we're, we're good. We're good together, but I can't be like, I, I can't like be let it known that like I'm your friend because right. like you're the nice guy and like I need, right. I need, I have a reputation. I need uphold. to uphold my asshole reputation. Right. Yeah. And it was very much so uh, intertwined in sports. I never played sports in school. It was very much so intertwined in those, the, the athletes and stuff like that. And, but like I took pride in the fact that I had friends with, I was friends with everybody. Right. I have, goth, whatever, sure. Mm. Emo, sure, whatever. You know what I mean? Cheerleaders, football players, soccer players, nerds. I was, I was like somehow wrapped into all of those social groups. So I was kind of like, I was kind of like slithering my way through like all and just kind of taking little pieces of each of them as I went. And it really kind of built me to what I am now. It right. built, it built my empathy. It built my, you know, my ability to understand and speak to people, you know, when, you know, you start to read signs and stuff like that on people, you know, body language, stuff like that. I learned an immense amount just from people, just from taking a leap and being like, all right, well, I'm just going to be friends with everybody. I just want to, I don't, I don't need a niche. I don't need a group. I just want to, you know, right. just want to be with everybody. So that kind of sparked when I got into middle school, I was like, well, how can I, what's, what's the biggest way that I can give back and, and, you know, be, you know, in serve and, you know, be with the people. It's like military, duh. That's, that's easy. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like that is from the moment I came out of the womb and got my immune system. Um, <laughs> I just always kind of knew it made sense. In elementary school, dude, I'd wear like full camo to school, and people would be like hillbilly, and I'd be like, no nah, man, I'm freaking ready to. Yeah, and that was like during Desert Storm. Yeah, I was this like, isn't real tree. Come yeah, on. I'm like, yeah, this isn't real tree. Like this yeah. shit's from Saudi Arabia. Like I'm ready to go Desert Storm right now. Um, and that's another thing too, like. Again, one of the earliest memories I have is, is during uh, gym class, um, and our gym teacher's name was Mr. Seaman. So oh, you can see why he rough. taught. You can see well, well, you can see why he taught elementary gym, right? Not high school, right? <laughs> he, he wouldn't yeah, stand yeah, in high yeah, school. No, yeah. not at all. He wouldn't stand a chance. So I remember one time we were standing in line, and I was like, "Mr. Seaman," I was like, "Look at my look at my pants," and they were like desert camo. I'm like, "You know where these camo pants are going?" And he's like. <laughs> like as a kid yeah, yeah. Okay. i'm like i'm like i'm like desert storm man i'm like america all the way and he's just like what the, Who the hell is i'm this surprised guy? he didn't call my parents he probably he, he <laughs> probably. might have he probably did we have, we have some concerns my and my dad my my dad being an army veteran he was probably like god damn right <laughs> yeah <laughs> there he goes <laughs> oh yeah so um yeah so i always kind of knew i'm like man that is just the best way in my opinion to to just go forth and just be the best i can be so um, back in the day when the army ads were, be all that you can be or right. whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, so to... my, my thing was, is 
I loved education so much. I was I was very much so an academic. I loved learning. I loved history. I did not I did not agree with where schooling was because you know shoving you know books down your throat that you have to read like a Shiloh. I don't want to read a story about a, a dog. Like I love dogs, but I don't want to read freaking Shiloh. Like why are you making me read it? Yeah. I was reading Tom Clancy in elementary school. And, <laughs> I was, and I was gonna, just about to yeah. ask, like, so you were able to make that distinction then? Yeah. But if you're reading Tom Clancy in yeah. elementary school, I'm gonna well, guess so. So quick, so quick side <laughs> yeah. story. Like I said, I'm a man of stories. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, I so know. <laughs> quick side story is when I was in sixth grade. Um, she's probably never gonna listen to this anyways. I think she's a principal now, but Mrs. Durkin, I'll never forget her. Mrs. Durkin, she was the English teacher. Uh, well, you know, back then you had like it was like English, math, social studies was all like one teacher. Right. Yeah, it was like general studies. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a, a reading assignment and everybody, it was either you had to pick a book or I argued enough to read a book that I wanted. And I'm pretty sure that's where the Shiloh thing came from because that always comes back in the conversation for some reason. But she was like, I, I told her, I'm like, well, I love history books. I love Tom Clancy books. You know, I was reading Red October and Hunt for Red October and I was reading all these books. I was like, she's like, okay, well, what are you reading now? And I'm like, Rainbow Six. It's freaking awesome that's like one of the best Tom Clancy books I've read you know and so she's like fine and so I so I read it I did my paper on it she made me present it in front of the class like I was the only one well good on her yeah good on her but she just wanted to make me look like an ass as as a as a sixth fifth sixth grade yeah teacher, well I guess it depends I mean? on the yeah you know, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna stand up for something, mm -hmm. like, all right, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Here here's we, your opportunity. Here we go. <laughs> but here's here's where the story twists, right? And these are things that I think about, you know, way later in life. Right. So I'm up there, I'm reading, and um, it was like towards the end of my spiel, I was giving basically like a, a synopsis of the book, and I said, yeah, and you know, and and so forth. It was imperative that you know this mission was completed or whatever I said, right? And she goes, um, Steve, what's imperative mean? I was like, very important. And she's like, mm, like that. And I'm like, why did she, why'd she react like that? Well, she called my mom and said that I had plagiarized the paper and, and the speech. Well, because you and, used the word imperative? Yeah, because I used a word outside of the vocabulary of, of an elementary school student. So my mom laughs, right? She thinks it's hilarious. She's <laughs> like, um... I would go into his room every night and he was like reading that book and then he would go and research more about it and research more about Tom Clancy and like he loves the military, like let him do his thing. Well, she failed me and because she said I plagiarize it. And my, so my mom fought oh, it I'm so hard. My mom, my oh dude, mom. <laughs> my, this is what I talk about. My mom is just the, the, the most amazing woman in the world. She went up, dude, she marched, she didn't just go, went up to school. She marched up to that school. We only lived like a half mile away. She got in, she got into the classroom. She pulled her aside and she's like, you created the questions for the essay. How, how can he plagiarize that? It's not like it was like a, like you're the one who prompted the questions and you questioned him on the book. Like how, how can that even be possible? Right. And she's like, I, you know, they put up a fight and everything like that. And mom's like, I, I want, I want another teacher or administrator to read the paper. I want them to sit down with Steve. Just ask peer him, review. Yeah, peer review. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So needless to say, and <clears throat> end of the story, excuse me, uh, end of the story, I ended up getting an A on the, on the thing. But my mom was like, my mom was like, no, 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 that's not it. My mom was like, I'm going to stand in the back of the class and I want you to put Steven back up in the front and you're going to apologize to him in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It didn't sit well with Mrs. Durkin. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, and, but, but like that showed me that like, some things are, are definitely worth fighting for. You know Absolutely, what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it, that kind of showed me. It was like she didn't believe in me. She doubted me that I even read that book. You know, right. and, and that was kind of like that was like the precipice. To, that was like the, the ignition. I was like, man, I'm on top of the world right now. I'm like, proved her wrong, did well. So, anyways, fast forward. You know, in, in middle school is when I decided. I'm like, okay, military is going to be a, a legit thing. This is going to be a serious thing. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. Being an academic. I knew I didn't just want to join the military. I didn't want, at 18 years old, I didn't want to walk into a Marine Corps recruiter, a Navy recruiter, and just be like, I want to serve. And they're like, okay, cool, take this test. We'll give you a job, and right. then you'll go do your thing. I never wanted that. So when I was in seventh grade, excuse me, when I was in seventh grade, I had a chemistry teacher um, who was a Naval Academy graduate. And my buddy Nick and I, uh, Nick Imes, 
um, who actually we haven't talked in years and we just reconnected actually just a few months ago, which is pretty ironic. Um, we talked and he really, Nick wanted to really join the Air Force. And well, I told him, I'm like, well, dude, I want to do the Navy. And then the, everyone's like, that confirms that he's gay. Like, <laughs> he wants to be on a boat with a bunch like, of dudes like, no, for a great. long period of time. This is great. Yeah. So I continue to get that flack. <laughs> yep. I continue to get that. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, because you wanted to be a seaman. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, Jesus. In the Navy. Sure in the Navy. <laughs> that was the first yeah. time you've heard that joke. Huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, man, I'm going to start looking hot, hot and heavy into the Naval Academy. Because I knew I wanted an education, but I also wanted to serve. And right. it's like, it's, it's not like if you're enlisted or if you go into the military and then become an officer, you're, it's not like you're not educated. That's not what I'm saying. Right. What I'm saying is like, I knew the value the of higher, ed- yeah, the higher education, higher military command. That's, that's what I was going for. Um, so at that point at seventh grade, uh, eighth grade, that's when I really started getting into really looking into it and what, what the requirements were. So while everybody was playing sports, while everybody, not the sports are bad, but while everybody was kind of just doing the normal things that middle school students were doing, I was grinding at you're, that age. I was ready to you're rock just and roll. keeping on being you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, every night I was up, I was, I was on the Naval Academy website every day reading about what the cadets were doing, what the requirements were. I read the requirements for the application. I memorized it so I knew exactly what the requirements were. I knew that I needed to have nominations from uh, from a senator or a congressman. I knew that I had to have a, a CV resume sent in of what experience of a 16-year-old, right? <laughs> Volunteer experience, 4.0, all the stuff that you would need to be a military academy graduate. So uh, Mr. Phillips was his name, the chemistry teacher. He, Mr. Phillips really helped me and guided me down that path. And then all the other teachers were kind of like banded behind me because they said that they never really met a student who was like, I got, I got to figure it out, man. Like I know exactly right. what I'm going to do the moment I get out of here. So I'm going to go to the Naval Academy or West Point or whatever, you know what I mean? Or even if you just want to be like, dude, I want to be an electrical engineer and I'm not going to stop until I'm the best electrical engineer in the world. Right. And that's just, that's just the grind that was in my head. So it turned into the kind of like a, what the fuck's wrong with this kid? To, oh, oh, this kid actually, he knows yeah. what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So I did as much as I could to build my confidence in everything I did. So I remember in eighth grade, um, the assistant principal, like, no kidding, like after school, I'll just go to the principal's office. I'm, I'm not even joking with you. Like, this is 100% <laughs> serious. I'll just go back there and I kick back and I'd like, I'd like grab a little like cup of coffee or something or a water and I just go sit with the principal. She'd be like, How's your day? <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> like, and we would have a legit adult conversation. <laughs> and it was like, I had these people on my side because I knew that I would need them as a resource later, but I wanted to continue to build those relationships. And it was, it was phenomenal. So I, I'll never forget. It was actually that day that I was in the principal's office. The assistant principal came in. He's like, oh, Steve's here. Like, it was no big deal. Like, I was, <laughs> like, up, Steve? Like, I was a staff member. Like, I was a staff member. It was so, it was so ridiculous. Such an or- unorthodox school experience. And my parents knew this, too, and they loved it. Oh, they I feel like you're pretty unorthodox. Nah, well. As a whole. So, oh. whatever. I, 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 really, <laughs> I, don't, I really don't care what people think of me. So, I didn't say it was a bad thing. Oh, no, I'm no. just saying. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I agree with you. So, but they, they came to me, and they're like, hey, listen, we want to we wanna pitch something to you. They're like, for 33 years... Greenbrier has never had a mascot. They, they just they have the suit, but it's like it's like literally under the gym, and there's like rat shit, in it, <laughs> and like there's like it's there's like dust and grime and stuff all over it. And they're like, they're like, do you want to like revamp the mascot? And I was like, yeah. So I was like, whatever. I just wanted to get my hands into everything. You know what I mean, I just wanted to do get involved with everything. So I was like, yeah, man. So. No kidding. Uh, they made an announcement the next day. They're like, Greenbrier Middle School is now bringing back the mascot. You know what I mean? And, I was, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like grinning. And everyone's like, what? A mascot? We haven't had that. And it was like this. Like we were called the Yeomans, which if you, I don't know if you know much about like a farming history, but Yeomans were like farmers, but they were like farmer warriors so like back in the day. So it was kind of like. Extra sharp pitch for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um but so yeah, I uh, I was the mascot in middle school. I don't think like some people caught on to it. Like people were like, "Dude, that's Steve." Because I'm, it's got to be him. I'm, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm still pretty fat, so I was like short and fat, and, you know. And everyone's like, you know, um, that's probably Steve. So like, the, literally, I did a basketball game the next day. Everyone's like, "You're the mascot, aren't you?" I was like, 
I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, nope. I'm like, I, I didn't even go the best way. I hate sports. Yeah, I'm like, you know me. I don't... Like, you know me, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> like one of the last basketball games, I tripped, and the helmet almost came off. <sighs> and I, some people saw like the back of my head, and they're like, dude. And like, so from the stands, they're like, Steve. Like everyone's like <laughs> screaming my name, and I'm just like, no, it's not me. But it was like, that was like such a huge confidence boost for me. Because I just wanted to continue to build my that reputation, right. you know what I mean. So, so from that, I put that on my resume for the Naval Academy. By the way, <laughs> um, that's the point of the story. <laughs> Had to reel it back. Yeah. <laughs> that's the point of the story, which is hilarious. Um, so then, at that point, um, I moved moved on to high school. I went to Valley Forge High School uh, up in Parma, uh, Valley Forge Patriots, and. Um, when I got to high school, first year, it's freshman year, right? So it's like you're just kind of doing the motions. Trying well, to figure out your place. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then when I got to when I got to the end of my um, freshman freshman year, I was still getting picked on a lot. And I remember looking at some of these Naval Academy graduates and um, just like other things too, like you know, Navy SEALs, Rangers, Delta, like all these, you know, all the things that I aspired to do, all the things I had a real passion for. Um, I'm like, man. I, I shot up really quick. Like in one summer, I grew like four inches, I swear. Like I shot straight up and then I ended up leaning out pretty well. But it was just like, it was like skinny fat. Right. And I remember looking at and aspiring to people, like I'm looking at dudes in photos and they look like ant. <laughs> and they're like there with like freaking beards and they got like big old muscles and everything. And I'm just like, I need to do something because clearly these guys are put through hell physically right let alone mentally and at that point i was like I'm pretty sure i can get the mental part down i'd been through a lot already and you know there's a lot of things that happened in my childhood that kind of you know built that for me right. but i was like i need to start doing something with this so i ran track for the first year and i wrestled first year i ran track again fat you know didn't really know what i was doing i started to lean out a little bit i was so bad i was so bad at track that they put me on the 400 and the 400 is a race in its own right that's just a pure sprint right then they decided to put me on the 800 and it hit, well, did just you guys like, run track are just, you familiar with track I, I did track for one year okay so i mean you what had, did you do though oh uh, i did the 100 the 200 the four by one and the four you, by four jeez up he's why you running after me <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was fast too man yeah yeah sprinter. i mean you okay. guys both have more motivation than me because i did track but i was like that running shit yeah. Mm -mm. yeah, I'm gonna throw weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, yeah so I'm sense. getting there. Yeah. So I'm getting there. So, um, so you'll know because you're on track. So, the 800 is a very mental yeah. race. You're sprinting those hundred meter straightaways, and you're or you're striding the 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 hundred meter straightaways, and you're just sprinting around the corners. That's that's typically the strategy, or flip flop depending on your your size and you know what what, what your technique right. is. Well, I sucked very bad, and I was letting down the team. So they're like, I, I read the coach's faces and they're like, how can we get this kid to not want to do track anymore? <laughs> so like one of the last meets, you know what they did? They put me in the hundred meter dash. Oh my God. It was so embarrassing. Uh, it was so, it was so bad. Like I didn't, I didn't know what to do on the block. I didn't even know how to set up the block. It was pure embarrassment. Well, they were setting you up. That's oh, absolutely. All That's Ab how, absolutely. If they didn't even teach you how to mm -hmm. set up on the block, they, mm -hmm. they were just being dicks. Yep. So, <clears throat> so at the end of the season, <laughs> at the end of the season, this is why I hate sports. At the end of the season, um, we were doing awards, and uh, this is going to kind of touch on what you guys touched on a few days ago. <clears throat> we were doing awards. My parents didn't come. At least I don't think they were there. Um, but they did this. They did the awards like in the gymnasium, not the gymnasium, the um, auditorium, for all the people who like legit won awards. And then we all went back to a classroom the rest of us and they're like okay timmy smith i'm like what is he getting i was like johnny smith jane smith and they're like steve naughton i go up there and they're and they hand me hand me it and it was a participation award oh jesus and i stood up there and i wasn't like crying upset but i was like angry upset i said what's this and they're like well you were at practice every day and you put in a lot of effort and everything and i said okay so I was doing what I was supposed to do. And so then like it's, it was, that was a very big defining moment for me because I was in front of everybody who, 
who was also kind of like on the same level as me. Right. And I was trying to like get them to like coo against the coach because I was like, hold on a minute. I don't want this. And they're like, we'll just take it. I'm like, no, I don't want a participation award. I didn't do anything. I didn't achieve anything. <laughs> right. I said, I don't want your stupid award. I'm like, you put me on the 100 meter dash. Something I wasn't even qualified for. Why would you do that to me? And everybody, in the, it was like, it was like, ooh, you know what I mean? It was like right. one of those moments. But it was like, it was, it was defining because I, I learned at that point. I was like, this isn't, this isn't right. Right. <clears throat> you know what I mean? This doesn't feel right. <clears throat> and I, I started to feel that shift in, and like literally just that moment and that, in that small moment in that classroom, I'm like, something is changing. Yeah. And we see it now. People talk about it all the time, the participation award society. Yeah. What well, and you know, I think there's a lot to when I think everyone, at least I think most people find figure out some point mm -hmm. in their lifetime where they look back at high school or they're in high school and they yeah. realize like this is this is, this is not, kind of a bunch of horse shit. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I kind of you remind me of when I, I played football throughout my entire high school career until my senior year. Right. I had to end up working full time. I was on my own my senior year, so I had to quit football. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as a football, I was, I was pretty good and you know, knew all the coaches, you know, real friendly. I knew the kid, you know, the coach's kids and all those things. But the second I couldn't play football, it was, well, fuck that kid. Right. It was like, whoa, what happened to the last seven years that we yeah, just- Yeah, no kidding. Like, it was like, whoa. And then that was the moment kind of like that mm -hmm. participation where it was like, Oh, you only care just because either you had to or you wanted something out of me. Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Like, yep. yeah, f fuck you guys. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It was like, and that, this, well, that was yeah. so. That was very much so the mentality that I had. And remember how I said I kind of started shifting about halfway through. Right. That was when I was like, oh, okay. So screw you guys. No one really cares. Right. And although that may be kind of true, there's some people I, out there. There's some people out there. Yeah. And so. I said at that point, I'm like, okay, I got home. I got frustrated. I was upset. I'm like, I'm going to give it one more try. I'm going to try it with wrestling. Give it one more. It's an individual sport. Track is too, depending on if you're running a relay or not. It's a lot of work though, running around Dude. a circle. <clears throat> Dude, <laughs> trust me, I know. And I was, I was not. I was not fit. I didn't exercise regularly. I just did practice. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't hit that point yet. Well, um, yeah, I wanted to wrestle and I hurt my back, like first practice. And I was like, screw it, I'm done. You know what I mean, I'm not doing this anymore. So at that point, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do here? Because I need to grind away at, at doing this military thing. I need to get fit. I need to get mentally and physically fit. Well, that was at a point too, where at the end of middle school into high school, um, when my brother and I's relationship kind of took a turn. So he's the older brother, four years older than me. That's a tough age. He beat the shit out of me, mentally and physically. Uh, more mentally than anything. Um, he picked on me a lot, a lot. And he knows it, you know what I mean? And we have a very close relationship now. We have a very, very close bond as brothers now. But when I'm talking about like beat me up, like, <clears throat> like the emotional sometimes is worse. Oh yeah, for sure. You know what I mean. I, I, then, then the physical, the physical mm -hmm. is just like, wow, well, I'm just gonna hit you back or wrestle right. or whatever, and then we'll wash our hands of it. But it's like, you know, if your peers call you fat and ugly or whatever, or you're a piece of shit. That's different. When your own sibling calls you that, mm -hmm. or and you, you just sit in your room, you know, crying. It's like brain bruises last man, a lot longer my, than physical my, ones. My brother really yeah. think that about me. You know what I mean? Right. So. Um, it was at that point, my brother, my brother used to lift weights. He was tall and skinny. He ran track. He was, he was an awesome athlete. He played baseball. He ran track and everything. It's not like I was trying to follow in his footsteps and my parents actually never even pushed sports on us, but my brother played football. He played baseball. He was a brilliant athlete. Um, but my brother was also on the five-year plan in high school. He didn't give a shit about school. He didn't care. <laughs> um, and he did, he made a lot of mistakes early in life and he knows that he'll openly admit it. Um, but it he, sounds like I have a lot in common with your brother. It, yeah, yeah. And well, you know, hey, a lot of us in life are just templates. You know what I mean? A lot of people just have a template, you know, and you can just kind of figure it out from there. So anyways, um, Brian used to, he, for Christmas one year, it was a Christmas for his birthday, he got a weight set in the basement. 
and he he would go down there with his buddies and they'd sling around some weight. It was like those sand weights, remember? Oh yeah, and, I and had like, some of those. Do, do you yeah. remember the, Do you, you remember cr- until you crack them and you're like, oh no, my ten pound well, weights, yeah, me too. Dang it! <laughs> do you remember the bars that came together and they had like the red it's, spikes yeah. in the middle? You remember those? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those were like super old school and like you'd put way too much weight on it and they would crack and those red spikes would be looking at you. You'd be like, oh my god, at least that's what happened to me. Um, well, I remember I'm like those, those weights are just sitting in the basement and. We we had a swimming pool when we were growing up, and I told we we were swimming outside one summer. It was the summer before my sophomore year, and I told my mom, I'm like, mom, I just like, I just feel like I need to get physically fit. I remember telling her that, and um, you know, and she's like, well, she's like, if you just put your mind to it and you're dedicated and you just don't quit, uh, among a very much more complex conversation than that, right? But those were the key points. She's like, just get after it. So I found myself in the basement, and. Every day after school, I would just go down there and just lift. I didn't know what I was doing, but I would just lift things around. I lay down on the bench and I just start pushing stuff. I get on the ground. I say, Everybody knows what a push up is. I would I would do push ups until my wrists were going to fall off. So I started to lose weight, gain muscle. I started running. I was running six seven miles a day till I had blisters on my feet. Yeah, I was going. I was I was so. It was like it was just overnight, man. It just like turned on, and I'm like, I'm going to do this. You know, and I remember my dad would come home from work and he'd be like, you better slow down and better <laughs> calm down. And I'll kind of cover this later. But that that's kind of like some PTSD for me, because like I hate when people tell me, oh, hey, slow down Take a little bit. I'm like, I, I don't even know how to put it into words. I'm just I'm always just like, don't say that to me. You know what I mean? Because it's like <laughs> if I stop, it all stops. Like if we life as we know it is how we see it through our eyes. It's how we perceive it through our through our lenses. Right. So if I stop. Literally, if I just want to sit in this basement all day, then it's every the world will stop. My world around me will it'd, stop. It'd be a little weird. Yeah, this is my basement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I like it. It is your. It is your basement. Yeah, Steve's just in yeah, the you're, recording you're studio. You're welcome to hang out for a yeah. while. I mean, it's Cassie's like, is he still down there? Yeah, it's been mean... three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yep. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I just grind it away. I just grind it away, and then. Um, my sophomore year of, of high school, there was a, a lifting class that I took because I really wanted to start to get into lifting. And man, when I took that class, you want to talk about getting picked on? That was the that was the mountain peak of getting picked on was when I got into that class. And they're like, oh, Steve's in this class? For real? Like the yeah. tall, skinny dude who couldn't run the 100-meter dash and well, blah, and, blah, blah. And, in that environment, too, because yeah. you know, I heard people talking the other day about how like you realize when – how. T- typical guy mm-hmm. guy relationships is oh yeah i mean you sh- we shit on each other yeah. especially in yeah. high school like that's, that's how guys kind of bond yeah, the, yeah. typically yeah typically is right. you just make fun of each other and you shit on each other as long yeah. as it's it's the intent like the intent of bonding right but especially in that testosterone fueled weight room environment yeah. and then it's like oh we're pick on everybody well yeah might as well pick on him too. Well, then it's only st- going to be worse. Well, then you, yeah, well, then you start, too- start to get into like hazing territory at that point. Right. You know what I mean? You get so it's that like, group mentality. Correct. Yeah. And that's very much so what it was. That's why I was saying like I was liked like individually, but like when it got to groups, especially in a setting where you're vulnerable, where it's like the only way that you can prove yourself now is like with f- physical, like with your body right. and you're skinny and you can't really do much or whatever. Like it's, it's very tough, you know, to kind of get yourself, you know, to in that mindset. So I took that class that, again, this is sophomore year and I'm, I'm going into detail on this just because it, it makes sense and it, it, it kind of defines who I am. It, it, there's a reason why I'm saying it. When I was in that ninth period lifting class, um, I remember I was doing chest press, dumbbell chest press and, um, Mr. Lahetta, Matt Lahetta, he was the, the baseball coach at the time. And he was just like, you're very typical, just cocky glory days, dude. But he was young. He was only like 28. Well, fresh out of high or a fresh out of college well, that's like, why yeah. he's like well i need to go back i need to go back yeah, <laughs> yeah and i need to show these kids and he was tall and skinny and so i remember he was in the lifting class one day with the baseball team and i had picked up <laughs> at my size i was again short skinny well was like starting to lose weight and everything i picked up 70s for dumbbell press Oof. And, yeah and so i was like i'm gonna do this 
like, screw it. Like, I don't care. So I had like, of course, like, I think his name was Amir or something or whatever. He's like the small little Indian kid. I'm like, come spot me. So he's like, he's like three times smaller than me. So he's like, he's like four foot five, like this big. And he's like super skinny. And he's like, you got this. It's like a yeah. set of a bad movie. Oh, dude, it is. It was, it was like, a, what is it, Batch Warmers or something? Like, that's literally exactly what it reminded me of. <laughs> so like, I'm in the corner and I got these dumbbells. And it's funny because I made a, a Facebook post about this. Um, and, and what's funny is my parents never knew this story. They, they only knew it after I posted something on Facebook about it. Um, so I lean back with those 70s. And I go to press them up, and I, dude, I failed so hard. I'm I didn't. I'm surprised I, you could even, yeah. get them up. There. Yeah, I didn't 70s, hurt. That's, that's, I didn't hurt anything, but like, I, I completely. Except your ego. Yeah, oh, <laughs> dude, it was hard. But like, I didn't let it bother me. I'm like, okay, we're in the gym to fail. That's what we're here for, right? right. But nobody understood that because it's high school. Right. So, he was a math teacher. The next day in math, um, the uh, Mr. Lahetta was talking about some sports team that lost, and I didn't care. It was like before class, everyone's getting their notes out and everything. And I'm getting ready. I'm like, again, I was a student in school. I was like, okay, notes are set, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And and he goes, he's like, ah, man, they failed worse than Steve failed on that chest press yesterday oh, in Jesus. ninth period lifting. And I was like, whoa, now I'm getting it from the teachers. Yeah, that's, That was rough. That's fucked up. That was rough. Everybody was laughing at me. Oh, it was so bad. I was so upset. And I never told my parents. I never told anybody, really. Um, there was only a few people in the class that like came up afterwards and were like, hey, man, are you all right? I'm like, no. Like, why would I be okay after something like that? Like, he's our teacher. Like, that's that's wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this, there's something very wrong about this. So at that point, I was like, I need to get out of high school. I need to get out of here. I need to get out of this environment. Because the environment that I was in, middle school was phenomenal. Every. I, that's why I told that story about the mascot. Everyone right. was like, oh, do it. We're supportive, blah, blah, blah. I was like kicking back with the principal and everything. Like, I wasn't trying to be a schmooze. I wasn't trying to be like anything other than just me. But high school was such a different experience. So it was after that, ma it was after that math class where I was like, I, I don't want to be here anymore. Right. I didn't want to drop out because I loved academics. I said, I need to fix something. So Mrs. Needham was my counselor. And I went to her and I said, how can I get out of here the fastest I can? And she's like, what are you talking about? You're like a 4-0 student. You're on the student council. You do all these volunteer activities. You organize stuff. You have a great girlfriend. Like, what's what's the matter? All these people are dicks. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't, I said, I don't belong here. Like, find me something that I can do that right. will make me productive. So when I leave these doors, I can go to the Naval Academy and be a productive military officer. That's what I want. And she's like, okay, we're on it. it. Took her about a week, and she contacted as many Naval Academy, uh, the Navy uh, officers that she could. You know, we got in touch with the Navy recruiters and everything. And she's like, all right, here, listen. Here's what I got for you. You need to do these courses. The, these ones required by the state. However, we're going to offer you post secondary education because you you have the academics. You're taking AP class, advanced uh, placement classes. Um, we're going to offer you the fact that you can just go to college now. We're Try C, Cuyahoga Community College, the Western campus was right across the street from Valley Forge. And she's like, if there's something you want to do, you're going to be in class with adults, college students. I was like, what have I been doing since I was eight years old? We're I've been mingling with these people. I'm like, this is what I want. This is, these are my people. This is, this is what I want to do. So they threw me into AP courses, the the, the post secondary education courses, my junior year, and I always tell people I've, I've only, I was only in high school really for two years because my junior and I guess you could quote unquote senior year, our levy didn't pass our senior year, so we really didn't have any classes. Um, so I was really only in high school for two years. Outside of that, um, I did. How does that work? Um, well, some so like electives and stuff like that. The when the levies don't pass, they can't pay the teachers to do all like the fun classes. So you. you can't do. Uh, musical education you can't do um you know, history of robotics or whatever you know what i mean you can't do all the fun stuff so you have to do these the required courses right. your, your english is your maths your histories um but all the other stuff was done at tri-c i gotcha but i still wanted more and she's like okay well she's like well what do you really want to do like in terms of education well at the time i had been hired by best buy i was working as a uh, computer sales uh associate and it sounds so official. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Computer sales associate at 16 years old. Um, yeah, so I was hired there. That was like my first official job. I worked at Mark's. So I was a stock supervisor there at 15. Get that. Um, yeah, that's a whole other story. 
man of stories. Uh, <laughs> But at 16, yeah, 16, 17 years old, I was hired at uh, Best Buy. But I told him, I'm like, I, I, I love people. I just don't like selling things. Like, I can sell, I can sell snow to a snowman if I had to. But I'm like, I want to, like, I want to put some, put effort in that I can see a direct result. And that was Geek right. Squad. That was a computer repair technician. Right. That's really what I wanted. I thought that job was so cool. So she's like, well, what are you doing? Mrs. Needham said, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I work at Geek Squad, or I work at Best Buy. I'm trying to get into Geek Squad. She's like, perfect, I got the idea for you. She's like, you're going to go into Cisco Advanced Networking and Computers courses. Cisco is a very large company based out of San right. Fran. Um, they make routers and switches and very complex computer parts. Well, they had that offered through Valley Forge as a post-secondary course. It was three periods long, which everyone's like, freaking sweet. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to, like, switch classes and everything. So... I did, I did the college for the majority for, well, I, I went to Valley Forge in the morning. I did my Cisco courses, which were like hot and heavy, man. Like that stuff was complex, man. We're talking programming routers oh, and yeah. switches. We did like, um, they call them uh, red flag, uh, you know, exercises, which is like where you're the, your hacker and stuff like that. So we're like hacking into each other's computers and stuff <laughs> like that. It's yeah. just making me feel like, I mean, yeah. I know my, my high school career was pretty terrible yeah but it's just making me feel even worse about oh, it because i'm, I, no, I'm, no, I'm like, not saying these no stories no no i've been like because i was like an i was an a student until i got to about sophomore year i think yeah because i had taken like high school classes and middle school and done sure. those things and then like i i my thing is i had the, the opposite effect it was like why am i doing all this shit like i didn't yeah. know what i want i didn't know what i wanted to do well yeah you know well, I, I had the why am i doing this i had the like mr lajeta's class was algebra i'm like I'm I'm never going to do this. And like some people are like, well, I use algebra and work. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to. This right. is stupid. Like give me geometry. <laughs> How far can my future son throw a football if he throws it at this angle? That's cool. You well, know what I mean? If, like that's the stuff we need to figure yeah, out. Well, I took algebra 2 twice. Well, it's, but it's be because you liked it? Well, no, because they told me I had it. So my junior year, they're like, well, you have to have a math class your junior year. And I said, well, why? Like, because you do. Because you well, just I, have to. I, right. already, I already had all my math credits because I took high right. school math classes in middle school. I was like, I already have yeah. all my math credits. Why? Yeah. They're like, well, you just have to have a math your junior year. So I was like, okay. So I signed up for Algebra 2 again. <laughs> oh, God. So you, just, you, know, you just keep all your notes? <laughs> no, well, I, didn't, I didn't have to because uh, math was like my thing. So I'm like, yeah. all right. And now at that point, I was just a pothead. And mm -hmm. I was like, screw high school. Like, I'm yeah. just going to graduate. Yeah. I would turn from A student to a, a C student within a year. Yeah. And I had like Fs and all. But sure. I was like, as long as I passed. But I remember the one time, the second time I took Algebra, it was a, at, a, it was a, at a career school. It was mm -hmm. a joint vocational school, whatever. Yeah. And I was leaving the class at one point, and the uh, teacher's like, Fred, I need to talk to you. So I'm like, all right, what's up? She's like, you ace every single test. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. right? She's like, and you haven't turned in a piece of homework all year long. I was like, I also agree on that one too. <laughs> she was like, you have a C plus. I said, okay. She goes, if you just did your homework, you, you would literally be acing this class with like a 99 person. Like, yeah. I was like, okay. And she just kind of looked at me and I looked back at her and I was like, well, a C plus is passing, passing right? right? <laughs> and she goes, well, yeah, but I said, no, right. good enough for me. And right. I turned around and walked out. Right. And that yeah. was my high school, not the, yeah. uh, well, that was very, that was very much so my brother. Give me, give me what I need to do. I'll do it. I'm just going to get it done and pass. Math was Brian's issue too. You know what I mean? Cause I feel like and math math classes we can touch on on maybe a different day i just feel like it's so it's not we're just not on par with what other countries are doing and with what like other private schools are doing like well, Mon montessori's and yeah stuff the like whole that. education system's completely yeah that's like you need to do a podcast just on education systems it, you need to, you need to bring in people who will be willing to butt heads like an administrator a teacher yeah. and then like eric a third... weinstein yes <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely oh, so bring you know, him in yes yeah. i do i'm very familiar oh, and weird. I don't yeah. think he's coming on this podcast either. No. Same with Chappelle. No. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually think I have a guy that just went through something super interesting with the school system and he was a he's still a teacher. Yeah. And he's he's controversial. He would be willing to he was in the military as well and he'd be willing to speak candidly. Mm -hmm. oh, that'd be so awesome. Wow. But yeah, so Yeah, so anyways, yeah. So back to um You didn't you went to school yeah, for two to, years. Yeah, I went high basically went to high school for two years. <laughs> right. So yeah, so I did Cisco for the two years. Um, or for, for like, you know, your junior, senior year. 
um, did really well in there. I, I had, um, I had gotten accolades for um, hacking into the school system. <laughs> yeah, I found I found vulnerabilities where I was able to access all of the um, disciplinary records. Ooh. So like everybody who had like really really like if I really wanted to get dirt on people, I could. So they actually and gave you like access to the no 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 that was the thing oh they you just did it yes oh <laughs> okay yeah. i was gonna yeah. say why would why would they yeah. let you practice on the no. system that no, 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 you no. could actually have it access to self-administered practice oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um but i went to conferences um i made it um i made it to the state conference uh leaderboards um for uh for the class and i actually ended up getting scholarships for uh computer networking and advanced sciences and computers so then I took that experience. I took it to Best Buy at Geek Squad, and that's kind of where I thrived there too. So I, um, I, I quickly advanced in the company there to an advanced uh, repair technician in Geek Squad. Um, fast forward, I ended up doing that about five six years. So um, now when I got out of high school, when I finally graduated, um, I spoke at graduation, which was really cool because, you know, I I got to a point where I was like, I don't want to be here anymore, and then Steve suddenly just vanished. Everybody in my class knew me, but there was only like seven people in the class. It was very much so a college course, like a, a, a like a selective college course. It wasn't right. like a lecture kind of thing. And then I would go to try C. So like this is this is like how my how high school went for me. What what, what do most people do? They wake up, like screw this, get get in my freaking Honda Civic that has a screwed up muffler, drive to school. I had one of those. Yeah, I know. Everybody did. Um, <laughs> drive to school. You I get in there. Special now. You you drudge through <laughs> mm -hmm. first through sixth or seventh period. Ninth period's usually study hall or eighth period's something stupid. And then you go home and then you're just like, let's go smoke weed. Let's go play video games. Let's mm -hmm. go do whatever. You I did that I mean? before school. Now don't get me, <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> so I didn't have to drudge through the first couple of. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Full disclosure. It's already been disclosed to the government. I got involved in that too. Like there's temptation everywhere, right? And you right. do it and whatever you experience it and then you move on. Um, I'm not perfect. So, um, but this was my experience. So I'd wake up, my first class was maybe at nine. I'd roll in. I would, well, first I would go to the gym. At that point I had started making money. I was like, I'm going to go to the Y. So I'd go to the YMCA. I would open the place up. I would meet the manager there at four 30. Of course you would. Yeah. <laughs> I, we would, I would open the door. I would work out. I would endlessly. And this is when I was like learning about fitness. This is like when I was truly learning about fitness, how to work out what the benefits of nutrition are, all that good stuff. Right. It was like, and like I said, it was like, it was like a rocket went off. Like I was just like so mentally ready to do this. So I'd work out, I'd shower, I'd be at school. I'd go to my Cisco classes. I'd have a nice healthy break, maybe an hour. I'd go get lunch. As a 16, 17 year old, I would freaking go to Panera or whatever. And all the employees were like, shouldn't this guy be in school? <laughs> right? At that time. And then I would go to try C, do my one class. And then I would go to work. I'd go to work at like noon or one. My boss would be like, do we need to call your parents? Like, aren't you supposed to be in school? I'm like, Dave, I told you about this. <laughs> like, you know, I'm in blah, 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 whatever. And then I would work from nine till about 11 at night. Or I'm sorry, one till about 11 at night. Oof. Yeah. So I put in about 10 hours a day as a 16, 17, 18 year old kid. And then I'll just do it all over again. Yeah. Yep. Sounds about right, except yep. mine was I got high before doing all that. Yeah, fair enough. Just <laughs> add, yeah. add a little bit of weed in there. Yeah, that yeah. was yeah. So working so, full time and going to especially yeah, high, high school, school. It's, it's high school. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's not fun. Well, you know, I it doesn't matter if it was fun or not. I knew what the end goal was. I knew I wanted to get into the Naval Academy. There was no other option, and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into why that was a bad decision. But there was no other option for me. Right. Didn't have a plan B. It was all on the table for that. Well, at least you had a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I did that don't. and I didn't have a plan. Right. I was just doing it this time. Right, right. <laughs> at least you had a plan. That's for sure. That's uh, something to be said for a you know a sixteen, yeah. eighteen year old. Thank you. Um, so it came to a point where um, senior year started to approach. I put in quotations because it was so unorthodox. Where everybody's doing like the career days and blah 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 and everything like right. that. I'm like I'm like at Best Buy fixing Sally's computer because her husband looked up too much porn. <laughs> you know what I mean? It'll bog you down. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like my counselor would call me. I'm like, hold on one second. I'm trying to get this Pornhub virus off this guy's computer. <laughs> so, um, so uh, parallel to that, I was uh, every day. I was like getting things ready for the Naval Academy at like 120. percent I was calling admissions like every week, making sure I had everything lined up. 
Um, I had applied for uh, nominations through congressmen and senators. Um, and I was getting all of my medical stuff figured out. I was working out every day. I was meeting the minimums for the requirements for the academy for uh, physically. So like right. push up, sit ups, pull ups, run, all that good stuff. So I got a phone call from um, uh, Sherrod Brown, uh, Congressman Brown, or Senator Brown, sorry, um, and then Congressman Kucinich, um, both of which who gave me nominations to not only the Naval Academy, because I had to go in an interview with their panel and meet them, gotcha. sit down with them one on one. My parents went with me with that. That was a really cool experience to meet them. It sounds kind of well because, like, for me, like as a young guy, everyone's like, you know, you talk to an adult and they're like, well, senators are nasty and grimy, and well, I'm like, they're near, they're, they're skeevy, and I'm like, okay, like for me though, it was like these are the people that are representing our country, and they're willing to give me a nomination to go be a military leader. That's pretty freaking cool, right? You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm gonna take that for everything it's worth. So when I met them, it was like meeting a movie star. Like that's how I like equated right. it in my mind. Right. I'm like, this is such a cool experience. So when I got there, um, when I got the nominations, I got everything set up. I applied to the Academy uh, for their summer seminar training program. And I got in. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. Hell yeah. It all came to fruition. So after I graduated, I went to the Naval Academy. I get in there. Um, doing my thing, training, and going through all the rigmarole of that. And I mean, that obviously the Naval Academy experience is a whole different story as well. Um, but the reason why I'm not going to spend too much time on it is because I was medically disqualified. Right. To talk about that, like, because yeah. I remember you, you, we mentioned that outside of mm -hmm. the conversation before. Mm -hmm. So it, was it because of the, the skids? Yeah, or? So now we're coming full circle, gentlemen. Right. So, yeah. So what happened is, is after, um, after medical review, and after reading, you know, everything, uh, the, the holistic situation, as they called it, the United States Navy believed that because I had an immunodeficiency, that's how they coded it, right. that I was not physically capable to serve at the academy. So I'll never forget when I got that letter because... The same day, you want to talk about like dealing with struggles, right? I, I mentioned I, I dated a woman in, in high school and, and uh, it, through the Naval Academy experience. Same day, she broke up with me. She, no, rel, no correlation. She didn't, I didn't even know the letter had come in the mail. So she was like, you know, breaking up. We had been together forever. High school sweetheart situation. Then I got that letter in the mail same day. And my parents were both at work. I was at home. I had the day off of work. And when I was reading on like the forums and stuff like that online and I was reading like the stuff from the Naval Academy and from like what Mr. Phillips was guiding me on, he said, after you send your packet in and you get accepted and everything like that, if you ever get just a thin envelope in the mail from the United States Naval Academy, it's never good. All right. It's the proverbial kick yep. when you're on the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right I got that point. and I'm just like, oh my God. So life came crashing down. So... I get home, um, I'm in my room upstairs, and I had never felt betrayal and sadness like I had ever felt than when I had that letter in my hand and my phone next to me, which was like the sidekick or whatever it was, with, <laughs> with you know, Nicole's name on it, I know, trying to figure that out. And I'm just like, I felt so sick to my stomach, I was just like, what is happening? So my mom and dad come home, they come upstairs and they think that I'm like dying. You know, they come up and I'm just sitting on my bed and they're like, what is going on? And like, I couldn't even make words. So like I handed them the paper and I was like, and also Nicole broke up with me. And my, <laughs> yeah. mo my mom just starts sobbing and my dad is like, what the f do I do with this? You know yeah. what I mean? And I could deal with the girlfriend, but yeah. my, my whole Jeez. life dreams are. Yeah. Yeah. So it all came Jesus. crashing down at once. So here's what I mean about the, I didn't have any other options. They told me, so the school year was starting right after the summer. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's college. Right. Well, they're like, even if you were to apply, there's no chance this semester. Like to reapply, to appeal it, to appeal the medical waiver, you wouldn't get in the school year. You wouldn't be part of the graduating class that you were with. And I was like, Oh my God. And there was like, it was like three or four of us because that was also when the military was going through a lot of cuts. 
and they were gotcha. um, they call them bracking, so a base realignment, um, which is basically like where they when you brack a base, it's it was it happened in the Clinton era when they closed a lot of the bases and they were realigning DOD spending. Well, that's kind of like what was happening, at least in my eyes, and that's how I understood it. And kind of looking back at it, it made a lot of sense because there was a lot of people that I was close with that also got medical waivers for like oh, you broke your ankle when you were eight years old. And although you may be fine now, you could come back and say it was the DOD's right. fault and you could have full medical coverage for the rest of your life. was an excuse for them to... Yeah, but I'm like, dude, I had a freaking bone marrow transplant. And and the bottom of the letter, basically what they coded it as was the same the same justification or the same reason that I, I basically had AIDS. That's that's It, it said, hey, they had AIDS, like... It was in that category. It was like you are disqualified for this reason, for these reasons: immunodeficiency, blah 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 Some blah blah, AIDS, yeah, immune disease. I'm or something. like, oh my god! I'm like, how is this even happening right now? So Not here's, yeah. So here's <laughs> the thing. So here's the thing. I didn't have a plan B, right? I only had plan A. That taught me really quick about contingency plans. So I was like, what am I going to do? Right. So for that summer, I just worked. I worked and worked and worked and worked. I put in, um, I was working full-time plus hours at um, Best Buy. Um, I I started taking other jobs. I took other just oddball jobs. I was a security guard at a salt factory. I I worked at a hotel. (laughs) Keep people Um, from stealing the salt? (laughs) Yeah, dude, it's so stupid. Well, it was an underground mine up in Cleveland. Oh, okay. They want to keep people out of it. Well, they were bringing in explosives, and they don't want people stealing the explosives. Oh, okay. Good um, call. Okay. That's that's legit. Um, And then... uh, I worked at a hotel. I worked. I was a, a bus boy. I was. I did a whole bunch of odd and end jobs, you know. And I just couldn't find my way at that point. I was so lost. So I was like, at that point, I was like, all right, I need. I need to serve. I need to be in the military. Like, I am not gonna have some somebody tell me that I can't lay my life down on the line for this country. Right. That is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. I'm healthy, young, able-bodied. I'm ready to rock and roll. Like it is such a disservice to our lineage. Like if I went up to George Washington and I was like, "Hey man, they're telling me no." He'd be like, "Grab a freaking musket. Let's right. go." So you how'd you I mean? get there? So so yeah. what was the what was the point that I mean that yeah. you were able well, to Well, getting there was not hard, was not easy. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do because I decided at that point, I'm like, "Well, I'm just going to go active duty then." Everybody takes active duty. You walk into a Marine Corps recruiter, and they're like, you breathing? <laughs> you like crayons? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the Marine Corps. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. So at that point, I was like, all right. I laid out all of my medical history. I laid out all the documents that I had from the Naval Academy. I didn't even sleep on my bed. I was sleeping on the ground. And this was when I, this was that summer when I was working and grinding. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to the Navy. I'm going to go to the Navy recruiter. I'm going to go active duty. I walk in, I don't even get, I don't even get 10 minutes into the conversation about my experiences. And they said, no, they're like, no, man, like, there's no way. I'm like, what do you mean? There's no way. Like I am perfectly healthy. Here's my clean bill of health. Here's I, I literally went to the doctor that gave me the bone marrow transplant, had him write a letter saying he's cured. There's nothing wrong with him. He meets all the physical requirements. Still wasn't good enough. So what then, was their excuse at that point? Just the same, same they, thing. They, yeah. They're like big, big. DOD, big government, is saying, no, you can't. Hmm. So I'd go home. I would still have everything laid out on my bed. Like I said, I slept on the floor in my room most nights because I had everything so organized that I didn't. I just didn't want to stop. So every day I would call the recruiters in Parma, and I would meet with the Army. I would meet with the Navy, the Coast Guard, whoever. It got to a point where I was becoming so annoying where they banned me from the recruiters and I still yeah no that's literally what it was and next to the Marco's Pizza I'll never forget it in Parma if anybody's listening to this from Parma they know exactly where that recruiting station is I'm not allowed to be there because I went there still to this day oh yeah because I went there so often I don't even think my parents know that I don't even think my parents know that like if I try to go get a Marco's Pizza and my face is on the door they're gonna be my parents be like holy shit that's Steve just wanted to buy a pizza yeah Um, because I would go in there so much and I'd be like there's got to be something we can do, guys. You know what I mean? And they were just lazy. That's really what it came down right. to. They just didn't want to put in the effort to write up a waiver to fight for me. You right. know what I mean? But I'm like, you're fighting for a guy who wants to fight for the country. That's what you rose your hand for. So, like, why aren't why isn't this becoming a reality? Like, why aren't we doing this already? So, so time goes on. Time goes on. I continued to grind away at it. I 
then I started branching out to all the other recruiters like in different cities, and then they started talking. Everybody started correlating. They're like, hey, if you know this Steve guy. Yeah, they're probably like, man, yeah. you should have, this guy yeah. is going to come in our this office the last our two months. He's got they're AIDS. Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, right. guy that's got AIDS? <laughs> He's talked to me too. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. God, that guy's a dick. It's um, cute. Ooh, geek squad. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah. And that's exactly what it was like. Um, but I wasn't going to quit because it was such a stupid excuse of why I couldn't serve the country, something that I wanted so bad. <laughs> right. So my mom's like, my mom and dad were just like, maybe it's just not something you were meant to do. I'm like, well, that might be bullshit, but yeah, parents just, gotta say that though. Yeah, of They're course, yeah. To, like, so, so my mom's like, you've always wanted an education. You're very good at academics. You love learning. She's like, maybe it's best that you just start looking into college. So I looked in. I looked into how I can still serve in a capacity that I want to do because the end goal was like, I wanted to serve in the military and government. And quite honestly, I just wanted to be a spook. I did. I wanted to be, I wanted to go travel overseas. I wanted to work for, you know, a three letter agency (laughs) and and do that stuff. That's because I was in computers and stuff too. And that stuff was booming, you know, you know, uh, cyber skills and stuff like that. I'm like, I would love to do that. And if I could put my name behind, you know, stopping a Russian terrorist faction from doing something stupid. Yeah. But you would have ended up being the, Snowden. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I would been go like, that far. No. Well, I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying. You're. I appreciate and, my. No, I mean, like, as far as how Snowden thinks of himself, it's like, look, I found something. This was wrong. Yeah, and well, I could. I just couldn't be quiet about it. They're that, very that's all well. I, that's all I meant by yeah, it. Yeah, it's a well. You know, don't get me wrong, and I'll get to like my position that I held in the military. I, I've seen a lot of things wrong in my position, but it's it's my duty to uphold the the oath that I took and the non disclosure agreement to not speak of those things. I'm not going to put my name on something and sign or, or take an oath to something that I'm not going to be, you know, that I don't, that I'm going to completely disregard. So, right. But even if it's, you go, well, this, there's this that, is getting off side topic. Yeah. Here, this like, is that more, this is that moral dilemma. Right. You know exactly. I guess yeah. that's yeah. The, that moral dilemma of, Hey, this is, yeah. Cause there's gotta be a point in everyone's, you yeah. know, internals where they go, you know, I, I did say I was going to do this, but mm-hmm. whoa, this is Screwed now up. you're making me cross a line Screwed that's, up. Yeah. Internally, I can't do that. Anymore. Right, like, you know what I mean. Like Jason Bourne stuff, like shooting a dude in the corner. Yeah, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I get it. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Side <laughs> topic. We can talk about that later. So, um, yeah, I don't even know where I was at. So, uh, you wanted to be in a three-letter agency. Yeah. So that would. Yeah, that was really the goal. So I was like, okay, let's start looking into courses that offer like courses in intelligence. You know what I mean? Like intelligence analysis and 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 like quantum computing and stuff like that and like to see if I can get like a job in NSA or CIA or whatever. Well, I came across Notre Dame College, Notre Dame College up in South Euclid, Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a um, an intelligence analysis and research studies program. And I was like, badass, cool, all right. So then I started to get more excited. You know what I mean? Right. I'm like, okay, well maybe, maybe, maybe my parents were right. So the only other, the other, there's only two other schools in the area that offered it. Uh, one in PA, and then there was another. Uh, Ohio State offers it as well. So I applied, and you had to apply. That was f- what's funny is like you you go to a school like you go to Ohio State, and you're like, hey, I want to be a student at OSU. They're like, okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's like there's really not much of an application process. Like, but no, this this you actually had to go sit down, meet with the assistant professor of the program, talk about what you want to do, talk about, hey, this is literally a program that's going to teach you how to be in the intelligence community. The things we teach you here are sensitive and blah blah, blah stuff like that. Like people right. who've all had experience in the agencies. So I was like, all right, this is pretty cool. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can get behind this. So I applied to the college. I got in. I got into the program, and I loved it. I was killer. I, I I quickly became the director of the club for the intelligence club. We did trips to D.C. We did um, we coordinated with the FBI. We did uh, tons of seminars. Um, and the schooling was great. I really loved college. Um, when I got to college, as a freshman, you obviously have to stay there. I had a great college uh, a freshman experience. Um, and then, uh, sophomore year I became an RA. So, uh, it was a great, great, great experience at that time. I had also gotten back with my ex-girlfriend. So it's like, ah, everything's coming full circle, right? This is great. Everything's happening right for me. So sophomore year, I'm an RA. I'm in my room on a duty weekend. Um, it was Friday before the duty weekend, which is duty weekend. You have to work, you know, just in case someone gets drunk or locked out of the room or right. car crash on campus or something. Cause I also work for the police department there. Um, you know, you respond to it. Well, I get a call from a, an awkward number out of a place called Mansfield, Ohio. And I'm like, 
I never even heard of Mansfield. Mm. I heard of the Reformatory, but I never heard of it's based. Yeah. That's Mansfield. Yeah, it's just it. That, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's good, old, good old Andy. That's it. Um, get busy living or get busy dying. Right? right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I answer it, and and uh, a woman's on the line. She's like, "Hi, my name's Sergeant Middlestat from the United States Air Force." And I said, "Cool. What's up?" She goes, "Somebody gave me your name, gave me a little bit about your story, and I think I can help you." And that is when I proceeded to shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was like, holy cow, this is crazy. Yeah, somebody cared somewhere. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure it was my, I'm pretty sure it was the director of the program because he knew my story too. Because um, it was the, it was an Air National Guard unit, which I never even knew. Most people don't even know we have an Air National Guard. We know we have an Army National Guard. Most people don't even realize we have an Air component. Right of our military for the National Guard. So I started looking into it, I'm like, Air National Guard, like is this is this the military? Like is this the Air Force? I had no idea, like is this a freaking militia? Like do they fly around like toy helicopters? Like what's happening, what is this? <laughs> um, so very long story short, um, she's like, send me what you have, send me everything you've done, we're gonna figure this out for you, we want you here. Cause she also learned that I was in the intelligence program and they were looking for an intelligence staff because they were swapping out airplanes. They were getting new airplanes. They were going from, they had the C 130s, which is a cargo airplane. Right. Then they went to the C 27s. C 27s is an army uh, army support aircraft, a little bit more agile, but they were going back to the, to the C 130s. Gotcha. And they're like, well, we, we cut all of our staff staff from the C 130s. So, um, you know, to get the J, the, the, um, the, uh, the C 27s, but now we're getting the, the C 130s back and now we need more, uh, right. more troops. More help. So it took about eight months. And I actually still have the email on my phone when she said, Hey, I got, a, I got really good news for you. Um, you know, you were approved, your medical waiver was approved. And what's hilarious is after all, after all the stuff that I went through with all the active duty recruiters and everything, and, and you're probably thinking of this from that Facebook post that I posted, I had gotten a letter from the department of defense. Basically it was a cease and assist order for me to stop calling the DOD and to stop contacting recruiters. And I called the chief medical officer at the uh, at the Pentagon, at least so I was told it was. Pro it was probably some staffer, to be honest with you. And I was, and he, that's um, the inspiration behind the Captain America tattoo. Because everybody called me Captain America when I was growing up. Blonde hair, blue eyes, wants to be in the military. My name's Steve. It all made sense, right? <laughs> it all fit. Well, I called him and I said, I'm like, I, I'm like, I got this letter. You're telling me to cease and assist. I'm like, all I want to freaking do is serve. My God. I'm like, you're letting people in the military who don't even know the difference between their left and right hand. And I'm like... I'm willing to give myself for this. And that's when the guy told me, he's like, well, he's like, well, son, this isn't, this isn't the Avengers and you're not Captain America. And I'm just like, well, you know what? Screw you, man. Like, I'm going to figure this out. So when I got that email from Sergeant Middlestat, like, hey, everything's been approved. I like, I had the letter in one hand and I had the email in the other. And I just bawled my eyes out. I'm like, this is happening. <laughs> this right. is it. This is, this is my time to shine. So I graduated college early. And I joined the Air Force, enlisted. I didn't go in as an officer. So I joined the Air Force. So you're actually able to join th mm -hmm. the Air Force. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so like, there's not there's not like a delineation between the Air Force and the Air National Guard. It's all the Air Force. Gotcha. The Air National Guard just falls under the it's authority. Like subsequent. It's Well, it's the th under the authority of the governor of the state of Ohio. So the same same way that the Army National Guard is set up. Okay, gotcha. So you can be in the Army. You're in the Army. You're just part of the Army National Guard. Gotcha. And Newsflash, the Guard actually deploys pretty much more frequently than than active duty personnel here in the states right you have active duty personnel that are stationed overseas like if you're in germany or if you're in italy or whatever like yeah you're there but the amount of rotations that guardsmen do and and reservists do is is yeah because i kind of crazy. felt that i have a yeah. um brother-in-law that um i don't talk to frequently but i know he was from my understanding he was in the army national guard but he's mm -hmm. i think he went to iraq like two or three times yeah and it yeah. was like well yeah, it depends on your rotation and what right. your unit's doing. So yeah, so I I, I rose my hand on um, August twenty sixth of two thousand thirteen, and uh, I was officially in the Air Force. Um, so I graduated college in fifteen um, because I well, I rose my hand. I knew the the risks that I was taking because I'd probably had, ended up having to go to training while I was still in college. So I was grinding away at college. When I got to like my sophomore, junior year, I was still directing the intelligence club. I was still working out hard. That's when I really started getting into fitness, like started getting into lifting, started getting into like really unorthodox styles of training um, because I eventually had aspirations of joining special forces. That's really what I wanted to do. 
not really going to do that as an intelligence airman in the guard, but that's what I had aspirations of doing. So that's when uh, all that kind of came to to light. So when I left, um, when I left for basic training, um, so I, I rose my hand in thirteen, but I had to wait six months, and that was the hardest wait of my life. It was <laughs> terrible. After all oh my god, it was terrible. So I rose my hand. I took the oath. Everything was great. Um, a month after I rose my no, it wasn't a month after. It was actually no. I rose my hand in August. I ended up leaving in June. So it was actually more close to pretty close to a year actually. Now that I now that I reflect on it, um, and the only reason what made me remember that is because I, everything was happening for me. Like I felt great. I'm like, dude, this is this is great. I'm getting my intelligence degree. I'm going into intelligence in the military because they allow you to choose your job in the Air National Guard. Gotcha. Sometimes you can go into just general, let them choose it for you, or they just pick from this you know, pool of jobs. But I'm like, no, man, I want intelligence. They were all about it. They saw a great path for me. Especially with the education already yeah, started. Yeah, yeah. So, so when I got in there, I was like, great, this is awesome. All right, so I'm just going to work. So I worked. I went to school. was dating my girlfriend. Everything's great. Christmas Day comes around. Girlfriend is cheating on me with what? a dude at her house. Why is it always Christmas? Guy. Yeah, to Christ, it's always, it's Christmas, Christmas or Day. Valentine's Day. Christmas it's Day. Always, it's it was pretty. Christmas. The relationship was pretty rocky leading up to it, but Christmas Day, I remember my parents and I we were in the car and we drove past her house, and I saw this dude that I used to work because she worked at Best Buy with me. I got her a job there. I'm like. Oh my god, that looks like that dude's car from Best Buy. Like, why is he? Why is he there? We were still kind of like together-ish. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like computer. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can make so many bad jokes right now. So many That's stupid. As far as I was so many stupid it, computer yeah. jokes that yeah. nobody would get. I'd be the only one laughing. Got the um, floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> show me the RAM. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I, I remember I, I remember I texted and I called her. And I'm like, you need to meet me. You need to meet me. I was like, I, I, like I, I basically told her my grandma died. I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, you need to meet me in the Walmart parking lot. Like I said, I've made mistakes Walmarts. in life. Yeah, in the Walmarts. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, we met yeah, all yeah. of them, all of them, all at once. All them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So we uh, we meet in the Walmart's parking lot, and um, I was like, dude, I know everything. Like, why, why is this? It's fucking Christmas day, man. Like, are you serious? I was so upset. I'm like, I, I'm like, I know I'm leaving for the military. Like, and I know I got all this college stuff going on and everything. It was just like, it fell apart so quickly. And so I was, I left in June, you know, 14 for the military. That's six months from, from, you know, December to, to June. Mm -hmm. Oh man. You want to talk about finding yourself that, that area right there again was like the most defining moment in terms of being comfortable with just being me. I'm like, okay, this is me now. Like if I want to go and join the CIA and freaking go travel the world and be a spook and all this stuff, I'm like, I'm going to go do it. I don't have any, I don't have to worry about girlfriend at home. Cause I was like, okay, I'll come I'm in the guard so I can come home and I can still serve the nation, you know, here in the, in the, at my hometown and get a job and all this stuff. And I was like, nah, man, all that came crashing down. So, she, so we broke up again, and that that was definitely for good, especially when you're cheating on me on Christmas Day. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean. so that that gave me some super bad emotional. Um, it, it emotionally screwed me up. Um, so I became so hyper focused on the military that, like, I was still going to drill weekends. I was just what's known as a student flighter. So you're in civilian clothes. You're in the student flight. You don't. You're not. You're not like doing any jobs. But I was still super engaged on drill weekends. I loved going there. I loved being in the military. I ran the PT program when I was there. So I was running through everybody, like all the uh, exercises and stuff that we did on the weekends, make sure these kids were ready to go for basic training. So, um, and then when I got to the, when I got to basic training, when I got on that bus and you're getting screamed and yelled at, and I'm like, finally, this is it. <laughs> it's like yeah. the, the one person yeah. going, yeah. Oh, oh, scream at me more. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's exactly it. When I was there, I... Tell okay, me I'm a piece of crap. So my, my military instructor told me I had a slap me face because every time I was getting yelled at, I was just like, I'm so happy to be here right now. You have no idea what I've been through. You just I, thought you were being through. a jerk. Yeah, I'm like, you have no idea what I've been through to be here. You know what I mean? So um, so I kicked ass in the military, man. I loved it. And, and basic training, I, re I was received double honors, um, small arms and, and uh, rifle marksman, honor graduate, um, 
I just kicked ass. I just loved it. I was the academic, um, I was the academic uh, flight student, you know what I mean? So like when we had like downtime on like Sundays and stuff, like, you know, the Lord's day. So it's like, you're not going to get yelled at as much. So it's (laughs) like, we had like uh, between like 6 PM and 9 PM, we had like study time. So like I ran all the study sessions and everything. It was such a good experience, made really, really great relationships with my fellow airmen. And then I went on to my continual training which in intelligence, it was, it's one of the longest next to the uh, special forces career path. So it, it was, it was um, six months, almost, almost uh, seven months worth of training nonstop. So you learn all about the intelligence community. You learn about, you know, how people, how we, how the military does military intelligence. So I tell people that I'm in military intelligence and they're like, kind of like you, you're like, man, we got to talk about the Snowden stuff. We got to talk about like how people are collecting data and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, if you really want to know what military intelligence is, it's like, I know the data of a rocket and how fast it's going to travel at an aircraft. And they're like, well, that's stupid. And I'm like, well, no, it's going to keep our airmen alive. Like that's, that's what military intelligence is. It's like, okay, how, how is this Russian aircraft going to react against our U S aircraft when they come into this airspace and we do this maneuver, that's intelligence. Like we're trying to predict the future with what we know from history, from history, from, from historical uh, studies and events. So it's like, yeah, did we get stuff from like human intelligence reports and did we learn about that stuff? Yeah, for sure. But that's like such a small niche of right. military well, intelligence. To, in order, to defend myself slightly, yeah, um, it's more more so like when we talked about before, it was the, mm-hmm. I thought you might have a unique perspective oh, definitely, on yeah. the situation. Yeah, you right, know, I definitely I, do. You know, like we had discussed um, before we had done the podcast, we talked about how, you know, a lot of people don't realize the the magnitude of what you're putting out there yeah. on the internet oh, and that yeah. kind of thing. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. and people don't really, and the effect. really grasp it. You know, for sure. Obviously we had the discussion of like the government really doesn't care what you're looking like, mm-hmm. what your, you know, favorite Pornhub videos are like, yeah. they don't care, yeah. but it's the, some of the behind the scenes stuff that, you know, yeah. that you have a different perspective on. You right. Know? Right. You know, it's kind of I like, think it's funny to me that most people like cover up like their webcam videos with like tape and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, I don't want the government watching me. I'm like, that's the last thing you need to be worried about. You need to be worried about Timmy. Who's like 13 years old. Who knows how to oh, hack yeah, into no, the go- Yeah. The government's the government not my concern at all. It's the weirdo care. that wants to like tap, tap into, into my your, Alexa or exactly, talk to my kid. Exactly. That's or it. Something yep. like, yeah. The yeah. Fucking... Like the stuff that I was doing in high school. That's so easy, man. I would freaking and I hate admitting this out loud, but whatever. It's on the table now. I'd go to Starbucks. And I was just hacking at people's computers. Just see what they're looking at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and it's just because I was curious and I knew how to do it. So I was going to do it. Like, I had I had a buddy like that yeah. when I was, you know, probably early 20s, late teens, where he would, he had that capability and he yeah. would, he would just hack into people's computers just to, just to fuck with them. Because it's easy. And he would take yeah. over their screen. Yes. And they'd be yep. like, yep. dude, I got yeah, it. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. He, like, yep. it would be that person going to that person going, mm-hmm. dude, somebody hacked in my computer. He'd be like, oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's weird. And, that's, yeah. and just to freak them out. Like, right. you know yeah. What, I mean? what I would do is I would sometimes hack into, like, this is when I was really young. Um, when I really started getting into computers, I would like hack into my sister's like AIM. You remember like the, oh yeah, yeah. when the door would open, yeah. like, oh, my boyfriend's online, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, but I would like, I would go in there and I would have the computer speak back at her though. So it'd be like, hello, Monica. And she'd be like, what the f- what's going on? It's like, I see what you're doing. <laughs> it's like, cause it's yeah. like a speak thing, you know? Right. But anyways, so. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, military. <laughs> no, it's okay. These things happen. So yeah. So, so yeah, when I was in uh, the military intelligence school, Again, super great experience. Made really, really great friends there. Bonded with a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I was awarded for the time and effort that I put in there. I, I read every night. I very rarely went out. I think I went out like maybe twice because I had just turned 21 uh, when I was in, in there uh, in the school. But I got, um, I was given three honors awards when I graduated. I uh, graduated top of my class. Um, and it was just such a good experience because then I was able to bring that back to Mansfield and help build that program because we had just gotten new airplanes so we were really building it from the ground up again um so i worked with a lot of really great officers and a lot of really great enlisted men who uh, which i was part of the enlisted to build those programs so when i came back from training i was like okay now what though because i'm a guardsman i'm fully trained my only op they say your only obligation is two weeks out of the year and, and one weekend a month it's it's really like quadruple that because you have training you have to complete, you have to go to schools, you know, you have medical stuff right. you have to do. Uh, don't let them fool you. Anybody listening to this, trying to get into the, the Air National Guard or the Army National Guard, if you just, if you buy into that, don't believe it. Because it is a hell of a lot of a commitment. You are part of the United States military. You're going to do what they say and when you do it. 
right. the, when required they want you to volunteer do it. Man. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it's like when they call you on a Wednesday and they're like, hey, the only time that medical staff is going to be here is tomorrow at noon. You need to get your stuff done. Right. You're going to call off work. You're going to find a sitter for your kid and you're going to go down there and do it. Right. It's now probably, they work with you, but I I'm just saying. I imagine it's probably one of the reasons that they yeah. have so many laws against yeah. discrimination for you know people that are certainly. currently serving. Certainly, and certainly. And, and then, yeah, like the uh, USERA rights and stuff because – like you can enact you, Sarah. Like we, I had an airman that I was training. He was in college, and Mike. And Mike is so brilliant, and he was so dedicated to the Air Force that he was in the middle of his semester, and he had to go to this one school. And he's like, "I'm gonna do it." He he told his professors, "He's like, I'm gonna, I have to go to the school. I'm gonna do it." And it's like that's what's required of you. Like that's the stuff that you have to commit to. So, anyways, what I'm saying is, when I came back though, I didn't have a job. What am I going to do? Just walk into the FBI? It doesn't work like that anymore. You know, back in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War, you walk into a CIA recruiting office or the FBI and you say, I'm a patriot. I want to serve my country. They'll say, sign here. You're good to go. We're going to teach you how to snap necks and, and gather intelligence, intelligence. You know what I mean? It's just not like that anymore. It's USA Jobs. It's a computer that filters your resume. Right. It's HR that doesn't want to talk to you who gets paid $40,000 a year and you're not worth their time. Right. That's how the world was. So when I came back... I told my mom, I'm like, well, all I want to do is like work for an agency, mom. And I'm stuck in Ohio at a guard unit. Like I made really good decisions. I'm really happy where I'm at, but I'm like, this isn't where I'm, where I want to be. Like I achieved my goal. You know what I mean? And I'm sure, I'm sure I'm going to deploy and I'm sure I'm going to serve and all that stuff. And I'm like, but I'm always wanting more. I was always like that as a kid. One more story, one more cracker. That's why I was fat. One more cookie. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I so, feel like yeah. anybody who has, who sets goals, especially at a young yeah. age, I mean, yeah. when you get when you get good at setting goals, yeah. you reach that goal, you're like, well, what's okay, next? What's next? Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. how I always was. I was always like, okay, what's the next level? So like commissioning sounded like a good idea. I had my degree at that point. I graduated honorably and um, from Notre Dame College. Um, and I'm like, okay, so what do I do from here? Well, after all of my training um, at the base, because you go to basic training, this is what I mean by your commitment. You go to basic training. Then you go to your advanced training for your job. And then you come back to your base and then you got to learn that job at your base. So it's like, there's, there's so many more levels of training that you don't even realize. Well, after that training, um, the commander came up to me and was like, Hey, we haven't had a full-time intelligence staff here who is willing to put in the grind and put in the effort and, and build these programs up in a very long time. The last person that they had there was an officer who was there for like 20 some years. And it was just boring. It was just right. the news. Like when they would get intelligence briefings, it was just the news. Like we need somebody who's going to take intelligence and give us something to act on. So I was offered a job there. I was offered a, a so when you're hired at, by the military and the guard, there's two positions you can take. Oh, well, it, depending on what you're offered, it's active guard reserve, which is basically you're on active duty orders while you're serving in the military. Like you still go to the base every day in uniform, you're active duty in in the United States, you're supporting an active duty function. Right. Or you get offered a what's known as a technician position, which is a federally funded job. So the federal government gives states money for you to work there as a federal employee. So you get all the benefits of like federal retirement and uh, TSP, Thrift Savings Plan, which is like a, you know, similar to like a Roth IRA kind of, right. um, it's just investments. So it's like all the perks that come with that. So you basically a federal employee. I was like, sold? I'll take it at 21 years old, <laughs> making yeah. 70, almost $80,000 a year at living in Mansfield. Well, I was living in Ashland at the time, living in Ashland, my apartment, $600 a month total. Yeah. At that I'm age, like, that kind of salary, that's single. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm ready to rock and roll for sure. So I took it. And, um, so I ended up working there. Um, and that is where I met girlfriend number two. Um, I'd only dated two people in my life. Um, we don't count Jessica in middle school because that was just like a couple no, of middle school doesn't count. Couple make yeah. out sessions and then <laughs> she's like, she's like oh, I'm sick of holding your hand. So it's yeah. like, all right, well, whatever. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Your hands are clammy. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's lunch and we're holding them under the table so nobody can see. Yeah, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, this is weird. <laughs> Even is at weird. that age, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so um, yeah, so I I met Emily, which was my is now my ex wife. Um, but so we, we met in the military, she worked in, uh, logistics and I worked in, um, uh, intelligence. So we started dating. Um, and you know, I had so, I had such a great experience from when I broke up with my, or when my, my girlfriend and I first broke up 
and I found myself, you know what I mean? I found myself in the world. I, I achieved what I said I was going to do. I joined the military. I'm doing intelligence work. Everything was looking great. And I started to get that confidence back where I'm like, okay, you know what I mean? Like maybe I'll find somebody who like just appreciates me for, for what I'm doing, the grind that I put in, all that good stuff. So we start dating. That's and always a double-edged sword. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when I got into the relationship and there were, there were some red flags, you know what I mean? Like when I, when we got into the relationship, she was really re well known as somebody who was a grinder as well. You know what I mean? She she worked in logistics, but she was offered a full time position in the inspector's office. So like the the IG of um, the inspector generals. It's kind of right. like internal affairs, if you will, right. of the military. Gotcha. So she worked there, and she ended up actually working with my boss because he took a tour up there as well at the at they call it the wing level. You know what I mean? And I was down, you know, supporting the squadron, and so. We ended up meeting that way, and um, so we started dating, and the relationship accelerated very fast. So she was over my place in Ashton all the time because I lived close right. uh, to the base, and um, you know she was there so much. She was living in Akron, going to school. She's a nurse as well, and um, so I was like, I was like six months, seven months in a relationship. I'm like, we need to just move in together because this is stupid. Like you're you're here all the time. You know what I mean? You're going back and forth, getting laundry and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, let's just do this. So we ended up, I took a huge sacrifice. I was only like 20 minutes away from the base. I ended up living in, in Fairlawn up in Akron. Oh, okay. So I was working full time there at the base and it was an hour and 15 minute drive every day. Yeah. It was rough. It was rough. And I was working four tens. So, um, you know, Tuesday to Friday, you know, with, with an hour and 15 minute drive. Yeah, that's, that's it. It was, it was rough. Yeah. You, you wake up at, which is something I was used to, you know, you wake up around three thirty four. you get ready, you go meet the van. Where's the van? <laughs> <laughs> Dang Cook fans. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we meet the van, we go to the base and then, then you drive home, you're home by six, you know, you put all yeah. your crap down by 6.30, you eat at seven, 7.30 and by that time, you're ready to snooze. I've been there, like yeah. definitely working 10 hour, like some people yeah. love those 10 hour days. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're single mm -hmm. and you're just living on your own. Oh, that's ten, fine. 10 hour days are great because oh, you have wonderful. a three day weekend every week, yeah, but like, yeah. man, if, or if you want to do anything else, like I've been there, you, yeah. I, I used to drive an hour to work, Yeah. working 10 hour days. Yeah. And then sometimes it was five mm -hmm. and it was, or you know, five 10 hour days and then, yeah. You end up by the time you get home, it's well, it's time to eat and shower and go to bed. Yeah, for sure. And it's like, man, mm -hmm. that's brutal after a while. Yeah. So it was at that time where, um, you know, we we ended up moving in with each other, and I said, uh, well, our, our unit was ready to deploy, oh, so okay. we were ready to do a deployment. So I was like, all right, well, hey, listen, this deployment's coming up. Um, why don't we get everything set for it? All right. So getting all the power of attorney and the, you know, the medical stuff and all the stuff that could go wrong. Right. right? So all the uh, contingency plans. Yeah, exactly. Which we learned a lot about those. Mm -hmm. So, um, during that time, um, so we were going to the Middle East, deployed to the Middle East and uh, phenomenal deployment. Great, great now, experience. You, you, were you both deployed at the same time? No, to, oh, no, okay. she so, stayed back. Yeah. Okay. So it yeah. was just, that, it was just me. Okay. Um, and so when I, when I deployed, that was a completely different experience in itself. You know what I mean? It I was can like, imagine. Yeah, this, I've heard stories. This is legit. You know what I mean? So it's like, this is what we're doing. And, you know, a lot of people are like, like I went to the Middle East. They're like, oh, my God, you get shot at. It's like I was in Kuwait, and then I did a couple flights into Iraq. Like, it's it's right. not like it was like people have this preconceived notion that if you deploy to the Middle East, it's like how it was in 2003 in Fallujah. It's like right. those times have, have long gone away. Right. Tactics and everything are still right, used. And it all but depends it's like, on what you're doing yeah, too. Yeah, because you know? yeah. I I have a another brother that was in the Air Force, another mm -hmm. brother in law that was in the Air Force, and mm -hmm. it's like I feel like from from what I gather, most of the times when I talk to people that were, um, you know, in the military, mm -hmm. any quote unquote cool story they have, most of the time they can't talk a whole lot about it. Correct. Like, you know what I mean? So Correct, it's like yeah. So it's like well, well just just stop asking those people because like if they want to tell you, if they have a story that they want to tell you, then they're going to, they'll tell it to you. Sure. But like, if sure. not, like, just leave them alone. Yeah, like, exactly. I, you know, I don't ask like, hey, what did you do six years ago this day? Like, yeah. what? What? Yeah, yeah. Like, I was, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's funny how I think people get kind of, that there's like a disassociation there that they kind of, they lose that person ability. And, or even, it's a weird thing too. Like my wife has, type one diabetes. And it's like people sometimes they, when they, when they don't know 
they don't understand the situation and they look at something that triggers them they go they just ask these questions it's like why would you ask somebody that question yeah, yeah. it's like why would you ask somebody about like the oh did you see people get blown up why would you ask somebody that like yeah that's a fucked up question that like yeah. that that some especially if somebody potentially could have sure. see like why would you go down that road and it's like mm -hmm. I think there's a dissociation with people that they don't realize, you know, even if it's nothing, a, a big deal, they don't, if that person had gone through something, mm -hmm. they think it's just okay to, Hey, let me ask you this really messed up question. Yeah. For like, for what reason? And I a lot know. of, a lot of people have asked me that too. They're like, um, cause I, you know, when I deployed, I was over there at the height of ISIS. That was when ISIS was getting really nasty. I mean, that's when they were cutting off kids and women's heads. And, right. Um, uh, daisy chaining um, heads together with explosives and real doing weird stuff really nasty not yeah. even weird it's or in, just beyond in, inhumane yeah just really nasty stuff and people are like well did you see that and i'm like well it's not like i was there but like we know of it and we know it's happening right. and we like when we gather intelligence when we get uh, like video that's leaked on the internet and stuff like that because they post that stuff it's disgusting like right. a, a live leak and you know those those types of websites on so the dark take that stuff down as fast as yeah possible. dark web stuff but right. but even at that once it's out man it's out it's, yeah it's out forever you know what i mean like this podcast right now you're gonna put it on youtube it's out it's out forever yeah. somebody's gonna download it the audio at minimum is gonna be out there forever mm. that's just how the world works even if, fun fact, I don't even know if you guys know this. Have you ever heard of the Wayback Project? Do you know what the Wayback Project is? I don't know. I don't think so. Wayback Project started in the 1990s, and it is a, it is hundreds of acres of servers in Nevada that are water-cooled where they keep the history of the internet on. It's always in Nevada. Why is it always in because Nevada? Because it's nothing but desert. It's desolate. Yeah. They, they use that area for nuclear testing and stuff like that. It's just inha inhabitable, so they're just... Well, let's just put a bunch of servers and computer junk yeah. in there. So, so anyway, so the yeah. way back. If, what? Don't get Fred started on aliens. aliens. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> I knew. Here we go. Like, no. yeah. Wait, is Steve no. getting there? Yeah, no, he's getting aliens. Area no. fifty one. No. 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 I'm smart enough to know that if there's aliens. They're not in Area fifty one. There's somewhere that we don't know about. Come yeah. on. Well, <laughs> yeah. Maybe you don't know that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, they moved them now because uh, did that storming the Area fifty one ever turn out? Because it wasn't that thing like no. last summer or something. They were like, oh, jeez. <laughs> I remember hearing about it. You I was know, like, that's you, a, you know, right where they're at. Hello. What? It's Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Oh, Good yeah, morning. Dude. Freaking Sunday morning. <laughs> I did. I, I literally said this morning. We're. Uh, I. Uh, I got up at like. So I've been doing this this week. This is why I feel like I've been shot out of rocket. I've been taking a page out of Steve's book. I've been getting up at like five o'clock, which is super early for me. <laughs> um, and this morning I'm laying in bed. My wife's getting ready because she has to leave super early for her training, whatever she's doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I just said, I was like, Good morning. Sunday, Sunday morning. morning. <laughs> yeah. She was like, it's Saturday. And I'm like, God damn it. Yeah, you didn't even get it, the joke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Um, Sorry. Yeah, go no, ahead. No, it's funny. The Wayback Aliens, Machine. Yeah, Area 51, Wayback. Way back. 51, way back. <laughs> um, no, it started in the 1990s. You can go to, it's called, a, it's either wayback.com or waybackarchive.com. But it is, a, it is an archive of the internet, and they are continuously building it. Everything on the internet. Not dark web, not like creepy stuff. Right. But like legit, if you go to this website, it's just like type in a URL and what date you want. So like, and I, the only reason why I know about this is because when I was in college, I did a, um, a research study on 9-11. Um, on so I wanted to see, we, I was um, juxtaposing between the intelligence failures of Pearl Harbor versus 9-11. Gotcha. And they're actually quite similar. You know, the, the amount of, uh, the lack of intelligence sharing between agencies and uh, how we weren't right. pl playing nice, you know what I mean? That kind yeah, of stuff. Real quick question. Yeah, yeah. Is it is, as much of a pissing match as some people would make it yeah. out to, yeah? Oh, uh, well, between, between agencies? agencies? Yeah. 120%. And okay. I'll tell you why. You know what it comes down to? Funding? Yeah, money. That's it. Of course. It's always, That's it. It's and, and I'll money. get into my time that I did in the Secret Service um, as an agent. But um, that happened all the time when I was an agent in the Secret Service because we'd have really good cases. And then it would be like uh, money laundering. And it'd be like over $100,000 of losses, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then FBI would swoop in and be like, hey, you need help with that? And I'm like... Well, no. They're like, let us help you with that. We got a lot of resources, and they weren't just helping you; they were stealing your case. Right. They because the more cases that they did, for it. yeah, and the more funding they would get. Uh, same thing with intelligence agencies. Now we play we play a lot better now. There's fusion centers, which is what was established after nine eleven. There's, um, you know, there's uh, like conduit agencies. You know, they, we have representatives and stuff like that of agencies mm -hmm. that come through and stuff. So, um, 
yeah, that's a different topic. But they they play a lot more nice now because we know that intelligence failures are very real. Right. But it still very much so comes down to um to funding. funding. Yeah. Um Henry Crumpton, if you want to really read a really good intelligence book, it's actually the best book I've ever read. I, I always tell people they're like, What's the best book you ever read? It's The Art of Intelligence by Henry Crumpton. I'm not paid by him to say that. Um, it is <laughs> Where a, does that stack? Because you told me about a book, was it the the last sermon that we had talked about? Was it the last sermon? Oh, the last lecture. Oh, last lecture. Completely last different lecture. Completely Oh, yeah, no, no, book. no. Yeah. But where does that... Because you said that was a... You read that book every uh, year? Yeah, right? uh, t twice a year. I would put that as, as my second favorite book. Because okay. They, I was wondering where they ranked. The okay. reason why is that I put the art of intelligence up front is because that was very much so my passion. And that was very gotcha. much so defining for me as an intelligence professional. Um, the things that Henry Crumpton did in, in the CIA was he, um, remember when I said you just walk into the CIA or FBI at like sixties and seventies and be like, I'm a Patriot. I want to serve. That's literally what the path that he chose. Cause you're in the cold war. He's like, I don't want to get blown up by a nuke. So he just walked into the mm -hmm. FBI and, or the CIA and he was like, I want to serve. And they're like, sweet. We need more people like you. And then he served a, a beautiful career and he was an advisor, um, in the white house. He's, he's just done tons of tons of great service to the country. So. But anyways, so back to my my point, um, which is something I don't remember right now. So you'll have to remind way, me. Way way back, everything's out there, and and I think it's yeah. And I have another just real quick too. Yeah, we have heard a lot of talks about, um, you know, blockchain technology coming out to yeah. Word to the fact that it's it's not even going to be a server in Nevada. It's just mm -hmm. it's going to be out there regardless even if well out there means it exists somewhere physically. So it has to be it has to be held somewhere. There's no such thing as the cloud. Like the cloud is something physical. Right. Like you can legit find where that is stored somewhere. It's all on a server. Like right. you grab something digitally, it, it has to come from something physical. It's not like it's just pulled from the sky. A lot of people think that. Right. Well, I think well, my my thing is is the with the I don't know how much you know about this. It's just mm -hmm. it's just a little snippet I heard, but but you kind of reminded me of that. Is they're talking about how the blockchain technology is coming out where it's it's not just going to be you know, you have that one location in Nevada that's holding all this stuff. Oh, where right. It's, it's going to be kind of decentralized yeah. to where it's being held around the world. Yeah, triple through. and quadruple contingencies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that blockchain technology is, is, is super fascinating regardless. So that's, yeah. yeah. I don't understand it, so it must be fat. Like, yeah, I, well, anything I like, I'm like, what the fuck again, are you talking about? When, <laughs> I was in the, when I was in the Secret Service, I did financial crimes. So we, I did, I studied a lot on uh, like Bitcoin and stuff like that because that's what a lot of people use to buy child pornography, guns, fake right. fake money, that kind of stuff. Um, so anyways, back to when, um, no, we were talking about military deployments, I think, right? Is that where we left off? When I was in, Af or not Afghanistan, when I was in uh, Kuwait? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember what the the way back. I don't know how we got to that. I don't, either. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But either, you went to Kuwait. Fair warning. And, yeah. But Fair <laughs> warning, I told you this would happen. No. Um, so, no, yeah, so I deployed. It's aliens. Yeah, I deployed. <laughs> um, when, I was, when I was deployed, um, <laughs> you know, you know what I thought, you know, it'd be really great when I get home, I should get married. <laughs> oh. Yep. So I made that decision real quick. Um, and obviously we were in love, right? I mean, we, we took the, we took a leap. We, we moved in with each other. Uh, we had a great relationship. Um, everybody has issues in a relationship. Anybody who tells you have that they have a perfect relationship. Punch, oh, they're lying punch them in the throat. Yeah, I, I met a guy one time at the base. Um, Maybe they're not he, lying. They're very, very deceived by their own mind. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, if you don't think that your wife goes out with her girls and they talk shit about you, then you're absolutely wrong. It happens to people who've been married for one year. It happens to people who've been married for 70 years. It happens. You know what I mean? So people, everybody has issues. Everybody has issues in their relationships, friendships, uh, family relationships. It's, it's going to happen. Right. Nobody's perfect. Anytime so any, you combine two people, yeah. there's going to be some kind of friction there. Oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I came home, um, and came home from the deployment in process back in super happy. Um, I had bought a trip to Cancun, um, because I'm like, well, I'm getting back from the middle East and I just want to go sit on a beach and drink as much as i can and from one sand to the other yeah. oh dude and that's the thing man everybody's like did you did you go where the sand was i'm like i don't think you i don't think you understand like middle east sand is not what Isn't you think it? is not what you think it's it is. not cancun sand oh my god no it's like filled right. with like rocks and grime and, and right. people are like but i see like egypt like the 
beautiful blowing sand. I'm like, yeah, that's like in the middle of nowhere. Like we're talking in like Kuwait, which is like near the ocean right. and all the rock and nastiness and clay and it's nasty. It's not good sand. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's even even Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan would not take his little jar and take that home with him. That's how bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. I think so, I think and that's that's a good point. I think yeah. a lot of people really, you know, they're their fantasy takes over reality and they, uh -huh. they don't understand. Cause I mean, well, I'll be honest, I've never traveled the world. Yeah. Um, but I, I know that my lack of perception of what things are really like sure around thing. the world is a, is a real thing. Yeah. Sure thing. You know what I mean? Right. I may not know what it's like, but I know I have a lack of perception of what it's like. So right. at least I have some kind of semblance of yeah. understanding yeah. there. Yeah. So the, um, yeah. So when I came back, I, uh, I decided to get, Engaged, so we went to Cancun after that. Get a little, feedback. You, yeah, a little, a little bit of feedback. I don't there. know if that's on the. A little feedback. Boop, boop, boop. I don't know what that's from. I didn't touch anything. I that's promise. weird. Well, oh, you know what it is? What? It's the Wayback Machine. It's the Wayback. <laughs> it's aliens. Is it aliens? <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't what's have been on? talking about them so much, Fred. Damn it! That's weird. They know. I, don't know what it's I knew about. I said too much. Yeah, no, it's fuzzy. It's like coming on all of ours, huh? Every time we talk. Yeah. Hey, let's uh, let me let me pause this real yep. quick. Yeah, you're good. We'll stop. I don't hear it anymore, so that's good. Yeah, I don't know what the deal was up there. It's all good. All right. Yeah, we had a little technical issue there. So it's all good. Kuwait. Yeah, I came home, got engaged. Deployments, got yeah. engaged. Yeah. So married. And then... Obviously, she said yes. Um. So, um. Yeah, so we ended up going to Cancun, had a great time, came home. Oh, yeah, the um, sand. Yeah, the, the sand. Sands. That's where we left off on. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I would not take I would not take Iraqi or Kuwait sand home with me. <laughs> this <laughs> yeah. is not something that I would do. Not a place to lay the anybody towel down to do some sunbathing. Anybody in. who's been to Iraq will, will definitely agree with me. <clears throat> but anyway, so, yeah, after we came home, or I came home, um, then it was it was it was interesting because you know you go from such a high tempo not necessarily high stress i because I, I think i managed the stress well you know we weren't ever really like put in a position where we were like we are getting shot at every day kind of thing you right. know what I mean? like we were in kuwait kuwait's an established country they're one of our allies you know what i mean like we were at an established base that has been there since desert storm i mean we liberated that base for them and Right, but it's um, a different environment. It's like mm -hmm. you, you hear people talking about they come home and then it's like how do you how do you acclimate back? To so yeah, the ac the acclimation was was interesting because I um I, I just brought that that active duty mentality right back with me and I was just ready to rock and roll like let's go let's go let's go and then we had we had a swap out you know what I mean so we we transitioned out we we brought some planes home so what happens is like we we they call it a flying organic we organically fly, flew our aircraft overseas so we could use them. In war right and then we fly them back and then we swap those out as they come and go right so we you know swap out troops and stuff like that so um so we came home and we were still kind of supporting from a from a domestic standpoint like from a state standpoint like if if one of my airmen were to reach out to me uh, well i was an airman at that time i wasn't a supervisor i wasn't an nco non-commissioned officer yet right. I, I was still an airman but I, if i still had like somebody reach out to me back in the states like hey where did you put this on this drive or this file or whatever where'd you put this briefing or what can you tell us about isis in syria or whatever you know right. I mean? like then we'd send emails back and forth so it was like it was very much so still in deployed mode right so, but you're still working out of mansfield, mansfield. at this point yeah yeah, yeah. Gotcha. i was still out of mansfield so um so then anxious steve started coming back and i'm like What's next? God, <laughs> this is boring. You know what I mean? So I was I was given so many tasks that weren't related to my job because I started to gain seniority and it was not related to the job at all. It was like, hey, this is really important and has nothing to do with your job, but it's really important, so you should probably do it. Especially right. as a, you know, aspiring leader in the unit. Right. So it's like, so we're gonna have you go outside and do inventory of our deployment case. <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like, cool. All the satellite phones are still there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's the same as it was because it's been zip tied for you know a year. Right. It's like that kind of stuff. Very administratively tasking, sitting at the desk kind of thing. So it sounds stagnant. It was, and I hit a ceiling. Right. So I promoted. I became a staff sergeant, 
And at that point, uh, we needed more airmen, so we, we began recruiting more airmen. But not me, the recruiting staff, obviously. People come in, they're just like, ah, I want to be in the military. And they're like, good, we have an intelligence position open. I'm like, okay, that's fail number one. They need to interview with us. They need to, right, you know is this what person I mean? good for this? Oh, yeah, for this job. And that's how I really think it should be in every career field. That's a different conversation, though. Right. Um, so... So at that point, they identified me. They're like, okay, well, you're really good with people. You're going to be the trainer. So I basically took on the role of being the shop trainer. I trained everybody on how to do military analytics, how to give briefings, how to speak in confidently in front of people, how to do these things, right? So for a good majority of my time at the base, I was, um, I was not only the intelligence instructor for the shop, but I was also... Um, the SEER instructor. So I went to SEER school, which is survival school. I actually did that before I deployed. Gotcha, right. um, I went to special ops school for uh, uh, ter anti-terrorism training. I went to force protection school, which is like base security training. Um, I went to all these advanced training courses, right? And I went to all the and as many conferences as I, as I could. That's the one thing I miss about the military is all the traveling and all the training opportunities that I had. Um, I learned in abundance from so many people in the community. Um, so then I came back, and then my airmen were fully trained, and some of them had issues. You know, it doesn't go without flaws. But, um, but then I'm just like, this is still I'm still not getting enough. Right. So then I started to hit that anxious point where I'm like, well, it's not off the table to still join an agency. Right. That's that's where I was. My yeah. next question: How did you? How was that entrance into the Secret Service? Yeah. That, well, that's that that's what kind of sparked it. You know what I mean? So. You know, like, like I told you, and, and my mom is so funny. She's like, honey, you went through this, and uh, why is that my mom's voice? I don't know. Mom, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, yeah. mom. I was like, is your, <laughs> I was saying, is is your mom, mom a feminine gay man? <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that seems like the stereotypical. <laughs> I've had a couple of friends with, with a yeah, voice like that. Yeah. Mom sounds like a dude. Well, mom, has, <laughs> mom must sound like that for the rest of the podcast. Mom. Okay, that's so fine. She's like, honey. <laughs> yeah. Um. She's like, I told you, just just go to the FBI and just tell them you want a job. And I'm like, Ma, you don't understand. Like, it just doesn't work like that. And I hate saying that, but it's like so true because like, I I I dare you go on USA Jobs right now and like apply for a job. It's it's the worst thing in the world. It's the worst setup the government could have ever. Come Moms with. are so like that though. They're like, yeah. well, why don't you just go I'm ask like, them? Honey, you're just so talented. Just go do it. Right. You just ask them. I'm, I'm like, like <laughs> Mom, here's what would happen. Here's what would happen. Uh, do you guys know where the Cleveland FBI office is? No. For some reason, she was all about the FBI. Do you know where the Cleveland FBI is? Do you know where the Brown Stadium is at? Yes. Okay, so like right up the street from there. Okay. Yeah, it's like right on the water, right, 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 like kind of near Burke Lake front. Gotcha. So, <laughs> get up there. Well, just up the street from it. Um, so I'm like, Mom, here's what would happen. I'd walk up to the gate. I'd be like, Hey, I'm a patriot. I want to serve my country. And the guy would go, Yeah, arrest. All right, buddy, him. arrest. <laughs> yeah, like, you are <laughs> yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, like right. that's the times we live in. It's not like that anymore. Right. You know, it's not like how it used to be. So. Um, so I started applying. I started applying everywhere. NRO, the National Reconnaissance uh, Organization. I started uh, CIA, NSA. I don't think FBI. I've ever even heard of the NRO. Uh, nobody knows about the NRO. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, oh, they do yeah. now. <laughs> well, they, they 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 were publicly announced in like '92, uh, but they actually started in the Reagan administration. They do uh, they do satellite reconnaissance. Gotcha. It's, it's very much so Cold War stuff, uh, but they have like ground units and stuff now. It's it's very very secretive agency. There's only like I think like a thousand employees. I think. Oh, okay. It's crazy. I could be wrong. I on could that. probably Google them. Though. I wouldn't. Google. You could. No, you can. They have. I, would, a, well, they I wouldn't have Google. I duck duck go them. Bro, they have. <laughs> <laughs> ask Jeeves. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> um, no, you, they, they have a freaking Instagram, dude. So it's not like there's oh, that. Oh, well, yeah. So people you know, know about it. Yeah, it's people fine. know about them yeah. now. I'm yeah. just saying. But um, it actually, the funny story about the NRO, um, and I could be wrong about this, but somebody actually slipped during a press meeting, I think, that they were on the intelligence community or the intelligence committee, I think, during an interview. They're like, well, on the NRO board. And the, uh, they're like, what's the NRO? Whoops. Yep. <laughs> and Reagan was like, how did you do this? Yeah. Why did you let this happen? Um, but anyways, so yeah, so I just started blasting applications and I was, I was getting to a point where that consumed so much of my life that I was, and I, I tell young people who come to me who want advice on like getting jobs and like, they're like, I need to find out like what I want to do. I'm like, take, please take my advice on it. Don't get on Google and do the cool jobs in Ohio thing. That's a terrible Everybody idea. does that. I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. Have you done it? I have not done it. Have you done it? Oh, uh, I think for me, man, I, I just want to. You just wanted to find no it, like. any, anything that was so I just looked up all the like 
either the regular jobs or the cool jobs. And I was like, I don't want to do any of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, wanna, that was I the thing. I want to do whatever's the, an aberration from, yeah. from the norm. That's yeah. what I want to do. Right. And, and that's you, and that's great that you have that. And that's why you're successful, I right? was lazy so. with both of you guys. I just kind of did what it came at me. <laughs> I did. Honestly, I'll, I'll be honest. This is the very first thing where I'm like, I want to do I this. I want to do this. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Honestly, so that's like, when you found it. 34 years later, I was like, yeah, I want to do it. this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, Everything else has just been kind of doing what I'm doing. But I, I'm, I'm not even kidding with you guys. I got to a point where I was like, Ohio Wildlife Officer? Hell yeah. Let's do it. Apply. Oh, Cleveland FBI? Sure, do it. Let's apply. Fusion Center? Sure, let's go apply. Um, fusion Center. Yeah, the, the Fusion Center. That what I was talking about what they established after 9-11. Like the, the oh, okay, that okay, okay. Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, like, yeah. I like, sorry. Like I've nuclear been listening fusion? Of, I've been listening to like, a lot of, like, Eric Weinstein, so I've been having yeah. a lot of nuclear fusion. I'm yeah. like, oh, anyway. my goodness. So, yeah, so <laughs> I applied everywhere. But here's the thing, man. Like I said about, like, the resumes and the key terms and stuff like that, and HR nowadays is a joke. You have to know somebody. Yeah. I, I will fight that. I, I challenge somebody to come up to me and tell me that, that that's not the truth. Unless they headhunt you, you have to know somebody in, in a job like that to get a position. I believe that. Especially in the intelligence community. Especially. You have to know somebody. Whether you're a senator's son, whether you know somebody already in there, very, very, very rarely can you just walk or go onto a website, apply, and they'll contact you. Right. It is so rare. And I'm not the only one who knows this. It's the USA Jobs, getting a job in the federal government, a legitimate, like, good position is very hard to find. And that's sad because the people it that, that want to yeah. do stuff like that are going to mm -hmm. look for well, it. Well, like P, like, I just, I wanted to go and run and do that. You know what I mean? So that kind of gets. Yeah, I mean, and that's a big thing, especially with, like, I had this discussion. It was something like this the other day with somebody about government. And, you know, I think I made the comment that I think that a vast majority of government officials are ill-equipped for their jobs yeah oh yeah, he's like absolutely. well why do you think that well mm -hmm. it's because those those people they're not like they didn't they're not like people like you that woke up and said this is what i want to do i want to be a senator i want to be in you know a congress you know woman I, this is what i want to do it's a lot of them are well my dad was rich and because he was rich and owned this company he knew these you know local officials and state officials and government officials and uh, you know so he sent me to an ivy league college and now i'm sitting on the congress i don't know am i a senator am i i don't know i can't remember <laughs> you know what i mean like i feel like that's a lot of those they're a lot they're just rich kids that got yeah. put into there because they hey well, in, in 20 sure. years we need someone to, sure. to lobby for us to get these laws passed so it's like yeah. it's a weird thing and you know i saw a lot of that at the naval academy because um newsflash my parents are not senators or congressmen it's a cleveland time <laughs> clock technician and a waitress you know, and a manager right. you know what i mean and it's like not it's a very unorthodox uh, path. It's like when I was at the Naval Academy, in my dorm, I had um, one was a senator's son. The other one's uh, his dad owned or was a, uh, a chief of engineering at uh, DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, all these people. And I remember like when we were at like when we would go to Chow Hall, I was quiet. Like I, I had friends there, but I, I really didn't talk much because I knew my place. So I was just I just I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to get in trouble. Uh -huh. So. But people have been like, oh, yeah, well, my dad is blah, 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 blah. And, oh, yeah, well, my dad is at Yale. Yeah. And he's, I'm like, dude, I'm like, and it was, I still wanted to do the Naval Academy thing. But like, when I was like 20, you know, five, 26, 27 years old, like in my, you know, when I finally kind of made it myself, I look back at that and I'm just like, man, I would have never fit in there. It's so fratty and so. And that's just, a sad thing. You yeah. should be, you should be the, the prominent thing. Yeah. People going into government should be the people that grew up mm -hmm. that weren't right, you know, yeah. with a silver spoon, you right. know, as, a, right. as an analogy. And, it and like, don't get me care about the and country. don't get me wrong. Like, there are plenty of people who've been successful that come from that type of yeah. I'm not, yeah, family. and I'm not trying to yeah, say that those people are like that, but right. a lot of those people they're they're just there because it's all oh, this is the job my my dad got. Yeah. Me. It was the job you know yeah. my mom was able to get. me. You like, know what? It's like, that's sad. One thing that I the reason why I focus on my family a lot too, like my parents, is because. I will go on the record saying right now, and, and I actually, I was so corny about it. This is so embarrassing. <laughs> so corny about it. When I left for basic training, I used to do GoPros. So I used to um, rock climb, mountain bike. Um, I did, like I told you, did like a lot of unorthodox stuff. So I had GoPros and I would film everything. Like right. I would just do crazy stuff. The night before I left, I was so anxious, so ready to rock and roll for basic training. I, I had the foresight to realize I'm like, 
okay, when I'm out of basic training and I'm in my continual training, I want mom and dad to send me this box, this box, and this box. So I had already boxes already built up for me. I already had labels printed. Like I was ready to rock and roll. Well, I didn't sleep. So I'm like, I'll just sleep on the plane and I'll sleep on the bus on the way to, to San Antonio. So I'm, oh my God, this is so stupid. I made them a video on my GoPros of me um, basically just thanking them. Right. And it was like, it was like a, it was like a video journal. That's probably one of the greatest things of their life is being Dude, able to watch that. I left it. Okay. So dad took me to the airport and, um, I totally screwed with his mind. Sorry, dad. <laughs> I was, uh, I was getting all my bags and everything, had everything packed. Make sure I had everything on the checklist that you have to have when you get there. We get everything in the car. I'm like, crap, dad, I forgot something really quick. I didn't really forget anything. I had the the DVD. It was a DVD. Had a DVD, and I put it on their pillow, and then I left. And then I obviously got in the car, and then I left for base training. And then I didn't talk to him because right. we didn't have we didn't have contact. You know, all you could do is write a letter. Yeah, for like it's eight weeks or something. <sighs> yeah, like that. and it was like it was like a twenty minute video, and I was getting so choked up in it because I'm like. I have so many friends and I even people in my life now, I have so many people whose parents just, just don't support what they want to do. And it's so freaking sad. Right. You know what I mean? At no point, no, none, absolutely no point in my life, unless it was a danger to me or others, did my parents say, no, you can't do that. At no point. My mom was like, you want to go flip burgers for the rest of your life? Then you're going to be the best damn burger flipper you're in the be world. The happiest burger and, flipper. And guess what? And then you're going to work your way up, and you're going to hold the world record for best flip, burger flipping. Whatever. <laughs> I told my parents I wanted to join the military. Sure. Did my mom have aversions? My dad have aversions to me joining the military? Of course. Right. It's her baby boy, the miracle child, the kid who freaking survived birth right. for a bone marrow transplant, going off. It yeah, very well could go get killed. Yeah, you survived you know I mean? birth. Now you're going to go get killed overseas. Yeah. What the hell's wrong with and you? And that was exactly my mom's mentality. But never once did she say, I'm not proud of you or I don't want you to go do that. Right. That's huge. Never Dude. never once did I say, I want to do the Cisco networking computer stuff. Good. Do it. I want to work 10 hours a day at Geek Squad. Good. Do it. You know what I mean? Unless it was, some, like I said, unless it was a danger to myself or others. I'm Like, even when I started working out hot and heavy, like I told you, when I came up from the basement that one day when my dad Over. came home from work, hey, you better slow down. I'm like, dad. He's like, oh, I know. All right. Don't you tell me how to live my life? Yeah, <laughs> and he's and he's like and he's like, oh well, you know, you are looking good. You're slimming down. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, man. I know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> I cocky, got this shit. Co cocky little kid. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I made them that video, and it was it was it was awesome. It's it's embarrassing for me to say it out loud, but I look back at it, and I'm just like, and you're right. It, it was probably the coolest thing that they had ever gotten. And I had my little Air Force shirt on. Oh yeah, <laughs> it was so. You awesome. know, I mean, everything was set up. You know, as a as a parent, like something like. That's one thing you, I look, there's so many times I look back as a kid and I'm like, man, I was such a shithead. To yeah. Me, to yeah. We mom. all have those moments. You know what I mean? But it's like, okay. Like, so, so it's, you kind of remember those things and you kind of, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. I get why, I get why when I was just the biggest shithead, mom was like, oh, okay. Like, yeah. well, you know, like, so it's, it's really cool to, you know, yeah. if you have those cool parents and you're able to kind of th keep that in mind, the, right. the fact that you have that, that foresight yeah. is, it's, I don't understand it because yeah. I didn't have that shit when oh, I was you a teenager. Talk about, you want to talk about cool parents. <laughs> two, story, two stories, particularly about my mom. One was I was caught drinking at a party uh, when I was like 15 or 16. And of course it's like, not Steve, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I, I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so good it's so good uh <laughs> my poor mother so uh no i'm um yeah i was, at a, I was drinking at a party i remember i was playing beer pong and that was that was real beer okay anybody who plays beer pong now you do not know what it was like to pe play beer pong in the 2000s because like that's when the the beer was in the cup oh yeah with and all you, the grime yeah, and, and you the picked dust it, you dropped the ball yeah the, the floor, ball goes underneath it up, yes. you threw it again well yeah. that's why no one you, got you COVID. dip it yeah Back then. oh dude i'm <laughs> completely immune completely yeah. immune so, uh, um, I was looking ping pong balls off the ground. Dude, you think I'm really afraid of a cold? You got that right, dude. <laughs> yeah. You got that right. So, um, yeah, I was playing beer pong and at this front, just a random dude's house and we were completely drunk. And, um, and then the police came in. I saw them pull in. I, I was next to my, my one friend, Rachel. I was like, cops are here. I looked behind me. The door, the door was, the, the couch was in front of the door. And I'm like, who did this? I'm like, cause that's our only way out. I was going to run. 
Oh yeah. I was gonna run. And I and I, I looked back at the door and then I looked forward and then there was a cop right there and I'm like well, too late for that. Yep, too late. Dude, but here's the thing, man, like he threw me against the garage. Like I was like freaking doing heroin. Like we were all just drinking. He was so serious about it. He's like, Call your parents. Blah, blah blah and I'm like I had my little sidekick my little flip phone that I paid for by myself because my mom would not let me my mom would not pay for a cell phone for me she told me I had to get it on my own I called her I was like <laughs> okay mom so I'm at this guy's house and, and so what does the cop do for me I get like three words in he takes the phone from me get against the grudge ma'am this is officer dumb it's from oh, the Parma police department and my mom's like oh my god oh my god oh my god what's happening you know so so she comes and gets me right we're in the car N- nothing said we have to, I'm completely upset because I'm like so disappointed in myself. Right. I'm like, Naval Academy's gone. Nothing, nothing <laughs> in life is going to work out. Yeah. So I get home. My mom just sits me. She, she comes to the side of the bed and she goes, honey, we've all made mistakes. This is just a mistake. Go to bed. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And that I, was it. We never spoke of it again. And it was like, and that's, and that's like, that's the parenting style that will stick. Absolutely. Way I, more than the freaking than the belt or whatever. Don't get me wrong, that happened too. Yeah. And I've gotten the soap in the mouth, but like I'm just saying like <laughs> We talked about that never. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah oh yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So, but I totally yeah. I, I had the same kind of experience. You know, my mom was I, I never got I never got caught. I always I was always made fun of in high school by mm-hmm. my buddies. Yeah. They're like, "Oh, Fred never does anything bad." I'm like, no, I just don't get caught like you yeah, dumbasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but my mom, I remember my mom would be, you know, if you if you need a, a ride, mm-hmm. that was my mom too. Call, and then yeah. like I would just like, ah, mom. Yeah. And, and then yeah. I remember, like, do I need to buy you condoms? I'm like, God damn it, mom! No, Dude, like leave me mom, alone. <laughs> mom, mom and dad had the sex talk with me and my ex girlfriend Nicole at dinner. Ooh, like that's brutal. like it was nothing. Well, yeah. you know, you gotta like, and it was like detailed oh it's like gross yeah gross <laughs> make sure yeah make sure you like when you're done you like clean up and yeah. like, Jesus. <laughs> god <laughs> no wonder she broke up with me oh okay so last thing so that was story number one story number two real quick then we'll get back to it um no you want to talk about cool parents when i left for my for basic training um i had a huge party at the house had a whole bunch of friends over and like real friends, by the way, like all my f- true friends that I met were like met in college. All the people right. that you meet socially out, you know what I mean? Outside of that circle. Where Not you're the ones you're constrained required to. to yeah, required <laughs> yeah. to be friends with all the ones that called me names and stuff. Um, so I had a great group of people come over and uh, my, my parents got like two kegs and we were just, and they wanted to, they wanted to be safe. You know what I mean? They're like, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it here and you're going to put your keys in the bucket and you're not going to go home. That's how it was. Fine. Great. Well, we did a keg stand. Me and my mom. She <laughs> well, my, at this point, you said it was after college. It was. She, you yeah. said it was after college, so yeah. it's like it's not she like she yeah. whooped my ass. <laughs> She's like, yo, like Let me show 15, you how it's like done. fifteen seconds more. That's a long time. That's a lot of really beer. My mom gets down. She's like, fucking drop the mic, and she's like, yes. like, fucking fists up in the air, and I'm like, my mom is so cool. Um, yeah, she's an awesome woman. So. Um, holy moly! How did we get off on that? I don't know. That was good though. Yeah, that's, the, sure. that's, that's the whole point. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, the, the the video that I sent from basic training, and then uh, yeah, we're, then we're talking about getting. Oh married. yeah, but you're talking about uh, secret service, getting into secret service. Holy and moly! There it is. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks a lot, Aunt. <laughs> <laughs> he's just like he's like I'm so tired right now. <laughs> I'm just laughing. Usually, it's me bringing Fred back. So. Yeah, 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 no, I know. This is refreshing. This is refreshing. Yeah, give you a break. Put your put your fishing rod down. Um, yeah. So yeah, I hit a ceiling, and I was just like, God, I'm I'm just so bored at this base. I, I really can't find an out. So uh, Emily and I are sitting on the couch one night. It's like a Wednesday. We're watching. I don't know how I met your mother or something stupid that married couples do, and. Um, I get a call from a 202 number, which is Washington, D.C. area code. And I'm like, okay. I let it go. I was like, maybe a spam call or something. They call back. I'm like, okay, that's not, you know. Right. So, and it's like 6 p.m. So it's like we just got home from work because she was working with me at the base. She was on temporary orders like while she was going to school. You know, she wasn't a nurse yet, but she was going to nursing school. But she worked at the base. So I answer it and they're like, um, Hello, we speak to Mr. Stephen Naughton. I'm like, yep, this is him. 
And we're like, hi, this is Tammy, whatever, from uh, the United States Secret Service. And I was like, okay. And she's like, um, very long story, whatever she said, very long story short, she's like, um, we would be, we would like to know if you'd be interested in applying for a special agent position with the United States Secret Service. And I was like, you're kidding me, right? Because like, y'all don't headhunt. This is the Secret Service. So I hung, so I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was like there's no way this is real because then you're going to ask me for my social security number next and then i'm going to get my identity stolen <laughs> so she calls so she calls back and i'm like well this this woman's resilient right if she's really trying to steal my identity yeah let's see so i goes. said i said ma'am no offense i'm like because I, oh, I was working in intelligence i obviously had some experience in the industry I, I you know we did we do briefings on fraud and stuff like that and just to keep airmen safe right. let alone give intelligence on what's going on in the world um, so I'm like, okay, how, how, and what way can I validate, or can you validate to me that this is like legit? She's like, well, she's like, when you apply to a job on USA jobs, there's an option that says, uh, you authorize to share this application with other agencies. And I'm like, okay, I vaguely remember selecting that option. Cause I didn't care. I just right. wanted to get hired. So I'm like, okay, her validity goes up. So she's like, here's what we're going to do. Um, you'll see an email come through from me. You follow a link. We're gonna have to ask you a few pre questions, all this stuff. And I'm like, what the? What is that? It's like a Wednesday at 6 p.m. I'm like, is this really happening right now? So, so I get the email and it was legit. So what was it? Was it? Legit. What, it was. Did, it, they, did you ever find out? Like, did they tell you what it was about? What do you mean? That why they call it like they, what it was? They were, they were head hunting. And here's the craziest thing: is I got that phone call in October, of. 16 i think it was 16 yeah whenever it was october 16 we'll just say that yeah it was it was october 16 she sent me the link i applied to another application which asked more questions you know resume all that good stuff right. and that came from a legit source it was from you know united states secret service email blah, blah blah and a week went by and i didn't hear anything and i'm like okay so was this just kind of a fluke or what did I not meet their standards or whatever? No kidding. The turnaround time for me to get a conditional offer was six days. And I'm like, holy crap. So they sent me a conditional offer that basically said, okay, you have to do this, 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 and this. You have to go get your medical done. You have to come here to DC. You need to do your interview. Um, they had like a mass hire day. So it's like you went in, you did everything but your polygraph. You went in, you took the, the special agent exam, you did your medical, you did all this crazy stuff all in one day. And I had already traveled for like interviews and stuff like that, but this was like, this was big boy time. You know what I mean? Right. Like we're going to Secret Service headquarters and we're going to go, you know, do this like thing. Men in black in the opening scene. <laughs> yeah, dude, exactly. So, um, He's all like, this is pencil. When he's moving the table. <laughs> Oh God, so good, um, <laughs> and that was actually kind of me because, like, I was I was all about military. Like, my uniform always looked good. I took a lot of pride in that. I was very well groomed, you know. But I was I was very much so like that Will Smith esque where <laughs> Men in Black. I love that scene where that dude stands up and he's like, he's like, "Why are you here, son?" And he's like, "I'm here to be the best, or the best, or the best, <laughs> sir." And he's like, "Ooh, with honors," you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like that shit cracks me up, and right. I'm just like. I'm not about that. You know what I mean? Right. I'm just very much so just get in, get your head down, do the do the dirty work. <laughs> you, know, you don't need the fame. So so in talking with Emily about this, I'm like, this came down really quick. And the placement was for the New York field office, New York City. Obviously in sixteen was right when Trump was elected. Right. So they had the foresight enough to be like, we know Trump ain't gonna make White House his primary residence, at least at the time. Right. And if you remember when he was elected, he made Trump Tower his primary residence. Yeah, for quite a while. You do not have to live in the White House to be the president. You can make whatever you want your primary residence. Right. So what Trump do? He's like, let's make it huge. So he made it <laughs> Trump Tower. Right. Cause he thought the white, if you remember, he said the white house is old and done dirty and dungy and it was falling apart. All right. So he's like, my hotel's better. So he's like, boom, Trump tower, primary residence. So secret service goes shit. Yep. We just, we literally have to like 
multiply our security footprint by like 25%. Right. If not way more than that. Because the White House is pretty secure. Get, it's set got up the, and everything. Got the law, South Lawn. You got, you know, everything is very secure. You got the gates. You got cameras already installed. It's been like that for years. Not New York City, Main <laughs> Road, like <laughs> right, what, Trump, right, yeah, Trump International. Or, people live there. Right. People live there. So it's like. A lot of people live there. Yeah. People walking by every day. You right. know what I mean? It's like, I mean, Jesus Christ, we had planes flying into the towers. Right. I mean, that's so a complete change for the Secret Service. So I told Emily, I'm like, I think I'm going to do this thing. Like, my odds look really good. So she naturally freaks out a little bit. Naturally. And which is okay. You know what I mean? And we talk through it and everything. And we had ups and downs about it. And, you know, I'm like, well, you know, if I get in New York, like, we're going to have to move, or at least at a minimum, I'm going to have to move, obviously. Right. So, like, what are we going to do about that? So we talked it out. And, you know, the agreement was she'll finish up school. I'll go there and work. It'll be busy at first. Kind of give us some time to get my feet wet, get comfortable, and then she can come and join me. Good. All right. Plan plan set. So I go down to take the special agent exam. Um, aced it. Did really, really well. It was actually much easier than I thought. There were some difficult questions, but it was very unorthodox training. Unfortunately, we can't go into like why or what they do to train. Right. Uh, to uh, what What's in the test and stuff. Um they had to sign agreements and stuff to not talk about it, but um, it was just very, it was just very different. It, it wasn't just like a sit down test. It was like, you know, watching videos and then talking about what was in the videos. And it's like using right. your observation skills, that kind of stuff. So Probably being observed the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding <laughs> yeah, sure. how you react and stuff right. like that. And they're very much so taking notes on the yes sirs, the yes ma'ams, the respect that you're giving. Cause they're very much a hierarchy um, agency. You Makes know what I mean? Sense. Like right. if you are the lead, you are the lead. Like that is your position. Nobody, right. nobody can take that from you kind of thing. So I get back um, like three days later. They're like, you're good to go. All you need to do is a polygraph and medical. It seems to be pretty quick for something like that. Yeah, yeah. But did you hear the last word I said, though? Well, me me the medical. 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 Right. <laughs> like, oh, like, here we go again. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. So you know what happened, right? I, they, they reviewed my military medical records, and they're like, so you have AIDS? <laughs> right. like, I'm like, God and I was like, it. I was so frustrated. <laughs> I was like, are we seriously doing this again? Do all over is again? this going? Is this happening again? Jesus. So talk about mental resiliency, right? I was extremely frustrated. <laughs> the, I took my polygraph, passed my polygraph. I'm not a liar, clearly. I'm, I'm very transparent. Um, and passed the poly. The only thing that was holding up, me up was medical. Right. And I'm like, here we go again. But I've been through this before. So I'm like, so it's like, <laughs> easy. Here's all the stuff, right? Well, they have their own medical staff that thinks that they're just the shit. Um, and by the way, the woman who took care of me does not work there anymore. So I'll get to that in a moment. Um, she goes, no way. Sorry, DOD might let you in, but this is not worthy enough for our agency. I was like, I, uh, what? Like, I military honors always the highest pt score i was, I was like the second highest pt uh score in, in my unit i had all these accolades i was ready to rock and roll like, i'm like what is going on here like why is this thing the thing that always just holds me back it was so frustrating and it, but it's like it's like me it's like, like not something i can control it's, it's right. like part of me always well it's not even that it's it's your it's a past <sighs> yeah thing that yeah you like you said you were then, completely you know, exonerated yeah. for lack of a better yeah. term from it. So like, yeah, I think it's a problem just of understanding. It's yeah, really, yeah. And, and just in general today, it's just like people are holding on to so many things that mm -hmm. like, Hey, this doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Well, what happened? Yeah. Well, yeah, shit happens all the time, but it doesn't right. matter anymore. So why, right. why hold you to that? Right. It's like that's the waiver that I got from the national guard bureau went all the way up to the Pentagon. Like we're talking the United States Air Force, big Air Force approved it. And the United States Secret Service was like, not good enough. I'm like, well, then what do you need me to do? Like go to Trump's house and be like, dude, sign this for me. Like, <laughs> what do you need me to do? The, Fred, they had me go to every conceivable doctor. I had to go see, I had to go see the doctor who saved my life again, had him write more and more letters. He was so like, it's so happy to reconnect with him. But it's like, when I saw him, when I needed to get my, my medical waiver, like we embrace each other like we hadn't seen each other in years so it was like seeing me in the flesh like he's like oh my god this is why i do what i do kind of thing right um 
uh, Dr. Hostoffer, his, his name deserves to be um, said. So uh, when I when I saw Dr. Hostoffer the first time uh, when I was in college to get the medical waiver from the military, what was really funny is he was a stone's throw away from my college. I never even knew it. I literally walked to his office one day. I was like, oh my God, I go to college right next door. Like, how do we not know this man? Right. And like, he saw me as an adult and it was just so emotional. So it's like, we've stayed in touch. And so then I go back to him. He had moved offices, go back to him. And um, he goes, you're back again. And I'm like, I sure am, man. He still goes, kicking it. He goes, let me guess. Let me guess. Somebody thinks you have AIDS still. I'm like, yes, dude. I'm like, God, what is it. this? Yeah. So he wrote, he wrote me all of these. He wrote crazy amount of letters. Still not good enough from a doctor who's been in it for like 30 plus years Jeez. wasn't good, wasn't good enough they had me take i had so many vials of blood taken from me i'm pretty sure that they just were saying this so they could clone me because that's how much <laughs> blood they took like we're talking they do that in nevada too yes huh? it is yeah. there's <laughs> just like a there's just like a colony of steve naughton's out there that are just like being bred they're all out there just running in formation put you in the crisper bro <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeans. yeah. One of these days. Have you guys ever seen The Island? Uh, you noticed he didn't deny that. No, I didn't. He didn't uh, deny that. <laughs> you, guys ever seen the, you guys ever seen the movie The Island with uh, Ewan McGregor? I don't think so. What? Have you ever seen The Island? I don't think I Where have they're, the, they're, they're clones, but they're made as insurance policies, so when you die, they'll just replace you in real life. Oh, geez. That's Maybe creepy. that's what's going on. Oh, it's a really good movie. It's, an old, cool. it's an old one. Mid some people, well, some people say that's cool. what's going on with Biden and Kamala Harris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is my wife, my daughter. Yeah. Maybe, I, I mean, know. I'm the wife. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm the wife. <laughs> Whatever. Just make me president. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but yeah, so finally, after like a few months, so October was when I got the initial offer. Right. Um, the contingent offer was made in November. Um, polygraph and everything was in December. By the time I got all the medical stuff, I just grinded, man. I was just working so hard to get all this medical stuff done. I I took as much leave as I could from the military to go get vials of vials of blood taken <laughs> and all these freaking MRI scans, like all stuff that's like not even related to what I had to do. Right. Um, but finally, I got the approval. So I got offered the position and I accepted it in February, seventeen. So. When I got the offer, I had three weeks or so to get down to um, Georgia, which was the Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy, FLETC. Um, so I went down there, and um, yeah, when I got down there, um, training was phenomenal. It was it was a wonderful experience. Um, when you become a federal agent. It doesn't matter what agency we're talking about. It could be the National Forest Service, National Park Service, the USDA, the United States Secret Service, DHS, whatever. Every entity has a special agent. And if not, they have an entity that helps them do that. Right. So Fish and Wildlife Service, um, FAA, you know, obviously Air Marshals. So everybody goes through FLETC. That's the basic training of federal law enforcement. So that training is about three months, four months-ish. I can't really remember. Um, but it was intense. I mean, you learn about constitutional law. You learn about how to be a federal agent. You search warrants and car searches and anything you can think of to be a good, well-rounded federal agent. Uh, very physically demanding. Um, lots of shooting guns. Lots of you know learning about just a whole gamut of stuff. Right. And then from there, kind of just like the military, you go to your selective academy. So for us, obviously, it was the Secret Service in Washington D.C., um, the Raleigh Training Center. Um, so when I got to D.C., um, that was another four months, four or five months worth of training. So at that point, um, it was pretty much already set that everybody in our class was going to the New York field office. And when I was at RTC, the, the Raleigh Training Center, um, I contacted uh, the gentleman who was running my, my application. and Or not application, like basically my, our guide. You know what I mean? Right. He was like the guy who runs all the trainees. Like your so, manager or yeah, something. Yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> much. Pretty much. Yep, pretty much. Um, I was like... Emily and I were talking about it and she's like, I just, I just don't know. I don't know about this. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm moving to New York city, like as a nurse and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I get it, man. Like, don't think that I'm not on that empathy level with you. Like right. this is as difficult as it is for me as it is for you. So I worked my hardest to find out what I could do to get to another office. I wanted Cleveland. That made sense. Right. Right. But that's not where the United States Secret Service needed me. 
<laughs> you're in New York City. You don't go where you want. Yeah, Cleveland. Cleveland is what's known as a phase three office. So there's three phases in the United States Secret Service uh, career field. Phase one, which is mostly investigations and protection. So everybody who goes through RTC or goes through FLETC, the, the first academy, everybody, everybody becomes what's classed as an 1811 special agent. That's how they're classed in the federal government. You are a federal investigator. That's everybody's title, federal investigator. Then you go to your academy, you get your agent, you get your badge, and then you're good to go. Everyone thinks that the Secret Service is protection. Everybody does. Because that's all they see. Right. It's a very small portion of our job. Well, right. was my job. Um, first and foremost, you are a, a investigator, a federal investigator. So the Secret Service was actually founded uh, actually on the day that Lincoln was assassinated. Bad timing. <laughs> yeah. um, Got their first case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But what a lot of people don't realize is when the Secret Service was enacted, it was not for protection. The Secret Service was meant to be a band of men who would infiltrate into these organizations that were creating fake currency because during the Civil War, fake currency was running rampant. And at the time, in, in Civil War money, there was assessed to be pretty close to like $100 million out there floating in fake currency. It's a lot of money then. But yeah. So, because what would happen is you would have notes that were written for North Carolina. We well, take that note, a note is basically a, you know, a set amount of currency, right? right? Take that note to Tennessee, and they look at it, and they're like, well, this doesn't look like our bill, because here in Tennessee, we have our own currency. They're like, well, just take it. It's good. Okay. Right. <laughs> and they would just exchange goods. <laughs> and it was so bad that there were coins and, and, and paper money was getting was, was being counterfeited quite quite rampantly. So Lincoln was like, we need to do something about this. So they created this band of men. They were called the Secret Service, and they would infiltrate and knock them down, right? Take down, right. Take down the, these guys who are making fake currency. That's how it started. After so many attempts on the president's life, because eventually the Secret Service fell into the Treasury Department. After so many attempts on the president's life, Congress got together and they're like, what agency is not doing anything right now? <laughs> what agency does everybody <laughs> not care about? They're like, oh, yeah, this stupid thing called the Secret Service, and they just investigate money crimes. Let's give them a dual mission. So they gave them the mission of protection, and they gave them the mission of investigations. So a dual rolled. So you have, to, you have right. two investigations. So at RTC and the Academy, we learned how to not only do financial crimes investigations. So financial crimes obviously have completely exploded. We're talking Bitcoin. We're talking... Oh, yeah. um, we're talking credit card. We're talking skimming devices. We're talking about getting put on joint terrorism task force because terrorists use fake money to buy guns. We're right. talking about people buying child pornography with Bitcoin, and it's not traceable. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Dark web purchasing. Um, credit card fraud. Identity fraud. Huge, huge world that had opened up for the Secret Service in terms of investigations. Right. Because you, you, can, you, know, you can The veins of money go through so many different aspects now. Well, and, and typically the adage is when there's money, there's drugs, and when there's drugs, there's guns, right? So then when you start to yeah. put all those things together, you start... If there's money, there's trouble, period. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, not that if you have money, you have drugs and guns. I'm just saying when bad people right. ha come When you have it. weird influxes of money, correct. it's probably for some kind of nefarious reason. Co correct, <laughs> right, yeah. So, um, so I told her, I'm like... So, so the phases, you know, investigations and protection. So, like, you're mainly an investigator, so you get put on financial crimes, and then like Hillary Clinton comes into town. Oh, okay, we got to go do protection, right? Okay, so oh. it's so it's like a. I'm assuming there's. I would imagine there's probably a specific team that follows details. The, details yep. the president, yep. but then whenever, you know, a particular you know person in government comes into town, as it were, Correct. then that's when Correct. it's just. It, there's not like a buy. It's a buy roll. It's Correct. not just, hey, you're a protection mm -hmm. secret service and hey, you're this. It's Correct. whenever someone comes to town. Hey, now. Yeah. It's and speaking of coming to town, you know, what's in New York City that's like attracts all nations? Anybody? Bueller? <laughs> so, I mean, talking about the Statue of Liberty? Or what no, 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 no. I, I first let the stock United, market. United but, Nations. Oh, you know, oh the UN. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, right, right, right. That so guess, guess who's charged with the protection of the UN? Secret, Secret Service. Service. So there's always any, people in town. Yep. So anybody who comes in from a foreign nation, the Secret Service is tasked with protecting them. 
So, and I'll fast forward really quick to the jobs that I was doing. Um, like St. Kitts. You guys know where St. Kitts is? Nobody does, right? It's a little island, so, you know, southeast of uh, the United States, way out there. They're their own little island, indigenous little population people, right? Well, every time the prime minister of St. Kitts comes in, he's freaking like crazy Jamaican, not Jamaican, obviously he's St. Kittian. St. Kittian, no. <laughs> but anyways, he would, come in, he would come in to do his UN stuff, right? Whether he's asking for funding or whatever right. from the United States. You want to talk about funding, though. We get put on his detail because he's from a foreign country. We're tasked with protecting him. Man, would he go out and just go to Gucci and coach and they w we would protect them. We would go around and that was our detail. That was what the Secret Service was doing in terms of protection. Now, the Pope comes in, right? Remember when he was cruising around in his Pope mobile with, right. the, with the big glass thing? Right. That was all us. That we, that's what we had to do was protect the Pope because he was a guest in our country and that's what the Secret Service is tasked with. So it's very, very task overwhelming, especially when the UN's in General Assembly. Like, I can imagine that's so a lot of people. So that is the and bad, you have to work. I'm going to imagine a lot of those people have their own, yeah, people at, as at well. Then, yeah. So like, how so is like that Israeli, trying to work with? So like the Israelis, right? So when they come and I got to be careful what I say, but yes, they all have their own. The level of protection is obviously layered, and there's different countries, you know what I mean, that have their own little protective details. But right. like working with them is is very interesting. I you bet. I mean, can imagine that's uh, lang super interesting. language barriers and stuff. <laughs> right. And, yeah, it's really really interesting. And just personalities too. Oh yeah. Like the guy from the guy from St. Kitts. I, I was a lead for him when he came into New York City, and you know you don't talk to him. You don't talk. You have a job to do. Right. Right. You're not there to make buddies with them. You're there to protect their life. If he had no protection, nobody would know who he was. Right. Nobody would know. Like. I'm not saying it was a waste of funds, but I'm just saying, like, if the Pope comes in, everybody knows who the Pope is. Well, actually, I don't even know if I'd be able to point out the Pope. To be honest, he might just look like an old man walking down the street from me unless he was wearing his, his right, robe. Right, his garb, yeah. Yeah. But, like, would you be able to point out Netanyahu out of, like, New York City, like, busy New York City street? No, he just looks like an old man. Yeah. Some people might. Yeah, there's very yeah. few people. Well, at the same point, because I mean, I've been yeah. in New York, and it is. There's a lot of people yeah, there. Yeah, but, but here, let me if, ask you. If there's this someone thing. looking for that person and they know where that person is, then that's. Let me ask the, you this. Now you're in New York City, and you see a box around a dude with guys in suits and guns. Oh, yeah. That now guy's, what do you think? That guy's important. Yeah, that guy's important for sure. Yeah, right. But it's the freaking prime minister in St. Kitts. It's like we just drew undue attention to him. Right. And he's just trying to go to coach. For some, yeah. The right. concern for some, now the concern for just some crazy person <sighs> right. is more. <laughs> right, exactly. It skyrockets. But anyways, so I told her, I said, you know, um, I'm like, I'm going to do my best to try and get... So phase, phase two is, is presidential, vice presidential protection, and then phase three is when you solely do investigations, some protection. Phase one, two, three. So yeah, everybody has their own little protective detail, especially in the states. The vice president, president, they have their own team. Right. And then when they go to select states, then the off the field offices provide support. Additionally. Because like in, in New York, like, okay, Ohio, right? Cleveland. If, if Trump comes to Ohio right now, his team isn't just going to roll into Ohio and start rubbing shoulders with the SWAT teams and with the FBI and stuff like that to help right. them provide protection. Like that doesn't doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's it's conduit the, that they yeah it's them both. it's the field offices here that work with the PDs every day that work with the sheriff office that work with the highway patrol that set up everything that needs to happen. Yeah, and there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there, a lot of things that happen when you know especially when the president comes to town. Cause, sure, know, I've even been in times where I've been flying around for work. In a helicopter mm -hmm. and just being in the airspace even not even in the you know the cleveland airspace as the, the airport airspace but just being in the air you know 12 hours before the president's coming it changes everything yeah where yeah. they're like you know because we i'll do um low level flying yeah and they'll every once in a while we'll get a radio in the tower hey cleveland wants you cleveland needs to talk to you we've got to climb way up so we can mm -hmm. talk to cleveland they're like hey what are you doing oh we're just over here doing still doing this thing Okay, thanks. They they just need yeah. to know where you're at. So it's like yeah. just the level of security that begins sure. way before just with yeah. everybody yeah. across the board. It's it's pretty incredible. Airspace alone is is very interesting when it comes to Secret Service. I'll just say that it's I can very, imagine. Very very. Well, it was even being there like I've yeah. you know seeing um, crafts in the air. I'm like, 
Yeah. Well, that thing's way up there, and it's moving really slow. Yeah. And then the pilots are like, oh, well, they're probably just you know mm-hmm. radio ships or whatever to help them land. Right. Ah, it's, yeah. There's just so much that yeah. goes into the. I don't think people. I'll say this now: Olympus has fallen is not factual. <laughs> <laughs> that would never happen. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was pretty. That, that was a thing that woke me up was just yeah. the, the level of things that are happening. That if I could, if I notice them as just a normal civilian, mm-hmm. then I can only imagine what's going on. That yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of moving pieces. So, so fast forward, I was like, "All right, Emily, like I'm going to do absolutely everything I can to to do this to to make this work for us." So I contacted the New York field office. and said, "What can I do?" They're like, "Well, we have a resident office out of Connecticut. They fall under us. They they need two agents. They're losing two. They're going to phase two. We need phase one agents in there. Beautiful. I'm like, I want it. I'll take it. And it was kind of like a mutual agreement because um, they kind of knew my situation and they kind of knew that the, the agency started changing the way that they were doing things because a, it, the Secret Service to this day is the lowest rated agency in the federal government. Lowest morale, lowest respect level. It is, it is the worst agency to work for, according to the statistics, according to the employee satisfaction surveys. Right. That's not a secret. That's not so secret about the Secret Service. Like, <laughs> a lot of people know that. Talk to anybody who's in the FBI. Talk to people who are detectives. Ask them if they know a Secret Service agent, and they will tell you it's not good. There's good stories. It's good right. pay. The quality of life is not good. So they started to realize that, and they're like, okay, well, we'll honor that. So they honored that. I got the New Haven resident office, so I, I was stationed in Connecticut. I still fell under New York. I still went to New York quite often, but I got – I was put on a – Cybercrime uh, Financial Task Force, so tapping into that history, you know what I mean? Right. Tapping into that lineage, that the experience mm-hmm. that I gained when I was younger. Still, you know, attack the computer stuff. And then I was put on the uh, Connecticut Financial Crimes Task Force as well. So I did um, uh, high-level, you know, credit card fraud, um, money laundering, investigations, that kind of stuff. So, so we're about three weeks away from um, my wife coming down. We're about to do our you know, move and everything like that. I had rubbed shoulders with the medical director at Yale, Yale Medical Center. I'm like, hey, listen, because I was I was also an agent that went around and made contingency plans for shit that would go bad. Gotcha. So medical is huge, right? So we <laughs> learned that quite often, unfortunately, too often from incidents that have happened. So, um, so I got to know the medical director, and I was like, so. I'm not asking for a favor. I'm just saying that my wife is a very well-trained nurse, will be at least. She knows her stuff. What are the possibilities? I couldn't even finish my sentence. They're like, yeah, bring her in. She's got a job. Immediately. It's like, <laughs> freaking yeah, sweet. Awesome. And, yeah. and what did I say about knowing people, right? Oh, a- yeah. HR is no. a joke. And oh, I knew yeah. that. And I didn't want her to have that stress right. of getting there and trying to find a job and everything like that. Well, she still freaked out. She's like, well, I'm, I don't know about this and everything. So... So about three weeks later after that, um, I didn't go home for Christmas. I was the duty agent, so I, uh, I had to work, you know right. what I mean, which is, I was the new guy, so it's like totally understandable. Right. I mean, she came Imagine down. you work a lot of holidays Yeah, well, yeah, she came down guy. for Thanksgiving. I was on call Thanksgiving. Nothing happened, so we still had dinner and everything, and uh, same with uh, Christmas and everything. Um, so March, March, April time rolls around. Uh, relationship is looking pretty rocky. Communication is not there. I said... Uh, I'm like, what's going on, man? Like, clearly there's something going on. Like, we were, she was supposed to move a, a couple of weeks ago. Right. I'm like, what's happening? You know what I mean? Just just be honest with me. Just be transparent. I'm like, please. And like, I kept talking. I'm like, I, I know I got to yep. dig this out. And then it came out, yeah, I cheated on you. Oof. Yeah. That's rough. And I'm like, <laughs> sweet. So I'll never forget the conversation that we had when we first started dating because I had the courage to tell her about my first girlfriend. You know what I mean? She's like, oh, that, well, that's never going to happen. That would never, couldn't even imagine doing something like that. That's the funny thing with people. They yeah. can't imagine doing it. They can't the imagine doing it. They, that they're capable of. Until they do it. <laughs> yeah. yep, until they do it. Um, man, whew, man, you want to talk about, you want to talk about demons being reborn inside right. of me. 
even right now, my fucking hands are, don't feel my hands, Ant. <laughs> They're all clammy. Yeah. You hold the hold hands under the yeah, table dude. again. <laughs> like, I'm ready to go lift. I shouldn't have had yeah. some coffee Sorry. with me. Yeah. yeah. Just... No, don't apologize. <laughs> don't apologize. I'm totally comfortable talking about it because people need to hear this. You know what I'm saying? This is a message that needs to be put out there because I've had a lot of people come to me f- f- looking for that advice and looking for, right. like, how did you, how did you, how are you the way you are now? You right. know what I mean? It's like, well, the way I am now is not something that happened overnight. Yeah, it never you does. It, it never is. And if it is, they're lying. Whoever tells you that is lying. Right. Um, oh, my God. It was the worst thing in the world. It was the absolute worst thing in the world. And so during that time when I was in Connecticut, this was before I found out about everything. Um, this was around January time frame. Um, I wasn't lonely. I had friends. I went out. Very loyal. Never, I never fooled around. I, I, was actually, I was actually really content with just going to work, doing my investigations. I'll do like surveillance or I'll go do- um, Yeah, I mean, how many hours a day were you working? Um, probably seems, close to 12. I was gonna you know say, because I mean? it seems like yeah. one of those jobs where it's well, just- depending. Well, dude, crime doesn't happen at noon on a Tuesday. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> right. every time we were doing surveillance or every time something would happen in one of my cases, I would get a call at like 2.30 in the morning and they're like, dude, they're, so I, I worked a case at a casino one time and um, the lead agent, he wanted me to kind of shadow him. He was a really great guy. Um, he was like, he calls me, his name was Bill, and I saw, like, I remember laying in bed, and I remember getting my phone, and I thought it was an alarm, and I'm like, why does, why does my alarm say Bill? <laughs> and that's what I, that was like, what was going through my head, because I was so foggy. Right. But then he called again, and I'm like, oh, shit, and it wasn't my phone, it was my Secret Service phone. So I answered it, and I was like, um, <laughs> we're going secure. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, dude, what's going on? He's like, um it's probably happening tonight. I'm like, what's happening tonight? He's like, we're getting a warrant approved t- tonight. Like, I can't talk about it over the phone. We gotta just meet me at this right. place. So I'm like, I feel like you wake up real let's, quick. Let's see if I can get this crack on the mic. I was like, ah, oh, damn it. Um, <laughs> I was like, crack my fingers. I stood up and I'm like, here we go. So I went and got my vest, went and got my gun, went and got everything I needed, got in my, my truck, turns lights and sirens, baby. It's time to party. Time to party. I had an, I had an hour drive. I ran. I did an hour drive with lights and sirens because we were going like 100 miles per hour on the highway because we needed to get to the place to to do the hit. So, anyways, yeah. So it's like that stuff will happen. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah. So w- when I was there, then in uh, January, February time frame, I wasn't lonely. I didn't have any problems with friends or anything like that. But I just, like I said, I was comfortable just kind of coming home and just like having a beer and. Maybe playing video games. Okay, whatever. Yeah, okay, I'm a 27 year old, 26 year old agent. I'm pretty sure I can play video games. Like I'm, I'm allowed to do that, right? I right. go on walks, go on hikes. You know what I mean? Like I was doing that stuff. Still kept on, obviously, in contact with my wife and everything. But so I told her, I'm like, you know, I told you we weren't going to talk about this, but here it comes. Here it comes. Two, two things, or three things yeah. I always wanted to. Do, <laughs> three things that I always wanted. I didn't in ask. Life. It's all right, bro. <laughs> I didn't well, ask. you are. We already set up for it. Yeah. Three things I've always wanted in life. Be in the military, check. Yep. Jeep Wrangler, check. Yeah. Got that right after I got right right after I got back from training. That's the only car I've ever wanted. Three, these are things that I promised to my parents that I would have: a, a be in the military, Jeep Wrangler, and a German Shepherd. Always wanted one, always. So I told Emily, this is in January, February time frame. I said, I'm gonna get a dog. <laughs> she goes, I think you're lonely. I'm like, no, I. Like I told you on the porch that one night, I said, "Nah, that's just like the last piece of the puzzle." Right. It that's, sounds like she was well, push pushing herself on. <laughs> maybe uh, she was the one. That maybe was or jealous <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. Right. Whatever. whatever. Um, you're gonna love the dog more than me. Kind of true. <laughs> 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 um, so, lo and behold, man, I, I made friends with obviously the local police there. I worked with them a lot. Knew the dog warden. The moment I decided I want a dog, I get on their website. First one that pops up. This little puppy named Norton. And I'm like, oh, God, he's so pretty. He's just fully adult male. He was about five years old. Super, super pretty. I mean, just the best looking dog in the world. And I'm like, I was sitting at my, I was sitting at, I was actually working from home that day because I had a lot of stuff to do. I didn't even go into my office. I shut my laptop and I'm like, oh, look at that. The dog kennel is two miles from here. I went right up there. I went up there. I was like, I didn't know that you were so close. I'm like, I live right up the street. The, uh, the Greg, the guy that worked there. And I'm like, 
I'm like, so tell me about this. Tell me about this German Shepherd. And he goes, How did I know that you were going to be here? He's like, I just had a feeling. He's like, I just had a feeling for some reason because he knew who I was. He knew I, I was married, but I was by myself and blah blah blah. Right. He's like, Well, let's go see him. So they get him out of the cage, and first of all, he was. Oh my God, his nails were super, super long. He stunk. He just looked a mess. This dog, he turns the corner. He was very, he was very shy. He turns the corner. He sees me. We lock eyes. I'm talking all 60 pounds of him jumped into my arms. Ju oh my God, it's beautiful. <laughs> and they're like, everyone there's like, is this a movie? Yeah, like, like, is there, like is there, is there a, like, yeah, like is, cue the music. Cue the music, exactly. <laughs> cue the violin. Cue the violin in the background. Yeah, tissue. Okay, I yeah, got some paper dude. towels back here. <laughs> so his story was that he um, he lived with a mastiff, and the family was continually getting tickets from the, the from the animal warden because the mastiff was bad. He kept breaking out of the backyard, and Norton was a follower. He's a German Shepherd, and he's just naturally he's curious. The pack. Yeah, he's following the pack, he's doing his doing his thing. Well, they they ended up getting Norton because they found a, dude a mastiff and a German Shepherd, full grown German Shepherd, walking the streets of New Haven, right? Like freaking <laughs> like thugs, yeah, like dude, right? that's so funny. And it, well, here's the thing: he didn't have a name at the time. Well, they called him Norton because he was on Norton Street. That's where they found him. Oh, okay. So they're like, well, what's this dog's name? Well, the, the mastiff's name was whatever, you know, dumbass. So <laughs> dumbass was out there breaking, you know, breaking the rules, and Norton was just following. So they took the dogs back, and they said, this is your final warning, or else we're going to come and take your dogs, and you need to fix your fence because clearly your mastiff keeps getting out. They're like, well, Norton's the issue. They're like, no, he's not, because we've actually seen off, like officers have come to your house and have seen the mastiff get out, and then Norton just follows. So like, if anything, get rid of the mastiff. Norton's fine. Right. They're like, no, take Norton. So that's how he ended up at the kennel. And I'm like, fine, take that beautiful dog and put him in there. I'll, I'll gladly take him. So I took him home. Inst instantly perfect dog. Potty trained. It needed some help on the leash. Needed to learn commands. But he was phenomenal. Oh, my God. It was the best decision I ever made. And everyone's like, well, what happens when you go to New York? What happens when you do this? What happens when you do that? I'm like, I'll find somebody to watch him. Like, this is awesome. Like, I found my buddy. Right. So fast forward to, you know, Emily telling me that she cheated on me. Um, I was like, I was sitting there on my bed and that dog comes around the corner and we like, we were getting to know each other. You know what I mean? I only had him for like two or three months. Right. And he just sits and he's like looking at me and I swear I saw him cry. Like he was just sitting there like, what the fuck what was wrong with this guy that just saved me? <laughs> you know what I mean? And he, he, he had never been up on the bed. I, I, it's not that I didn't allow him. It just, just wasn't a thing. He like slowly came up on the bed and he just laid next to me. And I was just like, I was on the, and I, I was calling my parents back and forth and stuff and stuff was going crazy. And I was just like, oh, man, what am I going to do? What the heck is going to happen here? Like right. all the things I've accomplished, I've said I would do everything. I did them, but now I'm modifying them because of somebody else. And I hate that. Right. I hate modifying what I said I was going to do because of somebody else. She's my wife, right? So there's a, a benefit of doubt naturally that's given there. But it's like that trust is so broken now. Like, man, how do you even react? Yeah, it's a whole different layer. It's a different layer. It's, it's something so hard to contend with. Mm -hmm. So I gave it a day to think about it. Tried con she tried contacting me. And I just said, I'm like, you screwed up, man. Like, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, what well, do I go home? Do I just stay here? Like, what well, what do I do? Well, the very quick decision was, um, and you know what? I'm I'm all right with the decision that I made. And so this is we've probably been on this podcast now probably for like an hour and a half or so ish, almost two hours maybe. Uh, about three hours and fifteen minutes. Really? Roughly three hours. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or just under, just under three hours. Yeah. Wow. So this is getting to your first question: How did I end up here? <laughs> right. Sorry. There's a lot. Well, I have something. Sorry. Else. So, so you talked about Norton, yeah. Um, and I don't want to get that. I don't want to get too crazy on you, yeah. But what do you think it is about animal? Do you think there's something? I feel like there has to be some kind of special layer there of communication between because they always say like you know some animals can sense your feelings, this, that, whatever. I absolutely like, believe that. You know, I for whatever reason I'm not a person that 
gets attached to animals. Mm -hmm. And I know, like, is it, do you think it's it's something that is is a special, like, superhuman power Mm -hmm. that you learned in Nevada Mm -hmm. um, that (laughs) that you can talk to animals? I'm kind of curious. You've been kind of quiet. I kind of am curious what your your thoughts are are on it. Oh, I mean, I I don't know. I'm not, like, an animal person myself. I mean, I've obviously, I have a biology degree, and so I've, you know, we touched on that before, but uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I honestly, I, I don't have the background with animals to be able to accurately answer that question and or the, yeah, empirical. So I can experience. give you my thoughts and theories on it, which is really all that matters because they're mine. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> um, growing up, here comes mom again. She's gonna love this podcast. By the way, I hope she <laughs> listens to all freaking three hours of it. Um, growing up, I had a stuffed animal. And it was a little gray wolf. And I called him Sad Puppy because Sad Puppy had like the cutest little eyes. <laughs> and I thought it was like, I thought it was like the most adorable thing. As a kid, like you don't really think things are like adorable or cute. It's either cool or not. You I know think what I mean? proven like, at this point you're not the average little wow, kid. Wow, well. <laughs> so, I've got AIDS, remember? <laughs> I've got super AIDS. So, so I had Sad Puppy man, probably, no, no kidding, probably till I was like five or six. Like, that's a long time to keep a stuffed animal around. You know what I mean? Like, right. I mean, kids keep, like, sentimental objects and stuff like that. I feel like more often than not, more, sometimes females mm-hmm. tend to keep, like, their emotional. stuffed animals. Yeah, emotional stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, I know yeah. my daughter has one that she's mm-hmm. had since the day she was born. Well, she lost one, so she had to rebuy it. Someone yeah. rebuy the same one. But it's, yeah. you know, when I was, I think I still have, my stuffed animal for when I was like mm-hmm. a baby, but it's like it's been in a trash bag in the corner of the basement right. since I was like twelve. Right, right. You know what I mean? So it's like there's a weird sure. attachment there. So yeah, so I had this so, I mean we grew up with a dog. We had a dog Shadow uh, growing up. He didn't come into the picture until I was like in middle school as well. But I grew up with with a, a black lab, Shepherd Black Lab. But Sad Puppy, ever since I was young, I remember just holding on to that thing so much. And like it was like I'm a very emotional person. I, I welcome emotion. Emotion is what makes us who we are, right? Anger, frustration, sadness, love. You know what I mean? Like that's it's yeah, yeah. different. If I were to ask you to define somebody without emotion, what would you say they are? I mean, as a word or just no, as... just as a person. Like, I have no emotion about anything. I mean, it's it's a it's a sad state of being. That's yeah. for sure. Well, it's sociopathic, right? Right. So, yeah. I mean, right. A, you just if you don't feel anything right. at all. Yeah. So, like, I embrace emotion. I embrace fear. I embrace sadness. I embrace frustrations. Like, I learned that really young because, like, when I looked, even though it was a f- <laughs> freaking stuffed animal, like, whoever designed it was a genius because it had emotion in it. The way its face was shaped and its eyes. And just the way that I appreciated it, it was like, this thing is like so emotional to me. You know what I mean? Mm. That's why I call it a sad puppy, right? So it's like, <laughs> it's always sad. So like, I need to be with it, right? <laughs> right? I need to love it. And so I know all your listeners right now are like, what happened to sad puppy? <laughs> Well, mom decided to sell him at a garage sale. Oh, no. <laughs> not sad puppy. <laughs> so... Um, at least I think that's how it went, Mom. So that puppy or, went to the pound. Or you threw it away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I don't know what that attachment is, but I have always loved animals, um, I've especially dogs. And I think it's just because, like, when we had Shadow, I was very attached to Shadow. Um, I would walk with him all the time. I would always play ball with him. He was always there when I came home from school. He was just he was a huge staple of our family. Um, and he was on an emotional level with everybody differently with my mom, my dad, me, my right. brother, you know, we all had different relationships with shadow. Um, and he obviously has since passed, but, but yeah, so I don't know. Well, I think there's, well, like I said, there's some credence to that. Cause like I said, yeah. I'm not necessarily an, an animal person. Yeah. Um, but you see, cause there's a lot of people who would be like, oh, this person has, they got a dog because they are deficient in some way and they try to fill a gap you know, in their life. So that's, well, that's the wrong reason to get an animal. Sure. But then there's people that just genuinely love animals. Mm-hmm. And then to, to your point, the perfect way you just said, you know, I, we had the conversation, my wife yelled at me that 
yeah, we were talking about how animals don't feel like we feel. Oh, that's complete crap. So yeah, she yelled at me too. But I think there is a, I think there's something there. I'm not going to necessarily agree that they feel like we feel, but we can agree to disagree on that. Or mm -hmm. you can just disagree. That's fine too. That's fine. But I think there is something to the fact that you, like you said, you can see animals that have a different relationship with different people, mm -hmm. particularly like a family animal. So I do, th I'm not, yeah. there's definitely something there where there is a different, yeah. so something there is, yeah. you know, and it's just weird. Like, is there, you know, some kind of an invisible vibe that, you know, people can have with animals that. Do you believe dogs have personality or animals have personalities? Uh, what's your definition of personality? Well, it depends on what your definition of personality is. Oh, well, your definition <laughs> should <modify. laughs> change definition. on my <laughs> definition. <laughs> Um, you know, that, that moment when he crawled onto the bed with me, he, kn he knew there's no way he didn't. Cause outside of that, he was just whatever, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and I'll kind of touch on what happened when I was homeless there for a moment, if we get to it during this, um, podcast, but, yeah, um, I mean, we can, oh, we can keep on going. We can make it a second one whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to listen to it, you're going to listen to it and, right. you know, um, but yeah, I, there, there was no way that he did not know that I was feeling something. I, I fully 120% believe that. And you, like wolf pack mentality, right? So right. like primal fitness, right? Our, our, our thing is the wolf. And yeah, that's kind of a play on Norton as well. But look at wolves when they get together. Mm -hmm. The way that they hunt in a pack, the way that they howl at each other, right. the emotion that's there. You know what I, I mean? Yeah, like, I, I won't disagree with you on that. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. it's it's so it's so much so built into their DNA to, to, to be like that. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't think anybody can ever talk me out of the fact that animals don't have personalities or emotion. I, I would never try to. Not every. I don't think like I think there's different levels. Obviously, the intelligence level of a of a wolf is different than that of an antelope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's not like people are like, "Oh my God, my antelope is so." loving and he cuddles with me i don't know some people was it that yeah. lady took a peacock on the plane because yeah. it was her yeah emotional emotional <laughs> support sporting. pigs yeah, yeah, yeah that, that helps yeah yeah no so i'll <laughs> say there's a, there's definitely a layer there. i'm not yeah. saying there's not a layer of some kind of sure intuition or sure. you know my my point that i was it's i don't think animals feel like we feel and how we interpret those feelings that's that's oh a, interpretation like, yeah, metacognition and, is completely different thinking about your thinking and thinking about your feelings is completely it's not like norton is at home right now and he's like mm, would dad be mad if i ate the steak on the counter he's gonna be like i'm gonna eat the steak on the counter I'm yeah gonna have, i'm gonna have no remorse <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna know when he comes home when he's mad at me because they can read body posture we've already yeah. determined that that's a I, fact. I will, I will yeah. agree to that yeah. you know what i'm saying but yeah. it's not like they think about that yeah that's what makes us different metacognition side story metacognition is actually what separates us between uh, uh, us and chimpanzees and i tell my clients this all the time the reason why i tell them that is because like whenever my clients are like on leg extension i always say do you know what metacognition is and i explain to them it's thinking about their thinking and that's right. really what makes us different from chimpanzees chimpanzees shit in their hand and throw it at the window at the zoo <laughs> yeah. because they don't think about their thinking they don't right. think about their actions that's why they're, they're some ruthless bastards well that's too. why they <laughs> that's why they twist the nipples of their family members because it's funny they don't think about it like i'm thinking about punching at in the face right now but if i were to do that That'd be a bad. That'd be a bad idea, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. Just wail them just as hard as I can, right? Uh, yeah. But I'm thinking about that, idea. and I'm like, that's probably not a smart idea. Yeah. If I was a chimpanzee, he <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> it would have been, been an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but I tell my clients that all the time because I. I say when they're on the leg extension, I'm like, man, I just want to give you a Charlie horse so bad right now. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? <laughs> right out there. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's thinking about your thinking is really what separates us. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't think, I don't think animals have that. I would, I, I would, I would agree on that. Level. Hence, yeah. hence why, hence why we're not chimpanzees. So, right. um, some people would yeah, <laughs> argue. <but. yeah. laughs> so, so I made a very quick decision after that incident happened, after that phone call, um, 24 to 48 hours later ish um i resigned i resigned from the secret service oh uh, wow yeah so i i marched into my office my my boss's office and i said hey i need to meet with you today at two because that's when i saw a gap in his schedule still did my investigations still did the job the best of my ability right um but i was so i was so gone at that point i was just like so it was that was it to to go home and yeah and hopefully salvage the yep. the salvage the marriage and because i'm like what will make this better 
what can I do? You know, and I, and I did eventually end up talking to her and she's like, well, I, I, she, she didn't even know, she didn't even know how to interpret her own feelings. So, um, so I'm like, all right, well, I'm coming home. You know what I mean? I'm going to resign. And within a day, which was pretty amazing within a day, I called my unit and I said, um, you know, some things happen. I don't want to talk about it over the phone. We can talk about it in person, but all I'm asking, all I'm asking is, do I have a job when I get back? Right. That's it. And they're like, we haven't filled your spot since you left. Nobody wants it. Nobody will work at the caliber that you have. So yeah, you'll have your job. So I'm like, cool. Very good. I knew the risk I was taking because when I took the job of the secret service, I knew I hit a ceiling already at the military, at the base. Right. So, um, so I came home, uh, I packed everything up within a week, everything in the house that I had. And, you know, in between that moving time, so adultery in the military is a crime. So the uniform code of military justice is a separate set of laws than civilian laws. Right. You run a red light, you get a ticket, right? Mm -hmm. You cheat on your wife, you're just a dick, right? <laughs> in the military, you run a red light, you still get that ticket. In the military, you cheat on your wife, you get prosecuted. You can, at least, I should say. Right. Now, that process is very difficult. There has to be proof. There has to be, was it consensual sex? Was it this or was it that? Right. You know what I mean? So we're talking military careers in jeopardy. You're talking her military career, my military career, you know, but not necessarily mine, but my right. reputation, all that good stuff. So my commander was like, it is highly recommended that you go to counseling. Highly recommended. Which when somebody at that level says highly recommended, it means good. It means go do it. <laughs> the so, forced volunteer. Yeah. So we met with a counselor, um, Vivian, who's has done more than I can even ever begin to describe in terms of helping me understand myself and, and the whole holistic situation. So fast forward, we went through counseling, all that good stuff. And um, that is how I ended up in Worcester. That answers your question three and a half hours later. So the reason why in Worcester is because I told her, I said, I will, I refuse to do the hour and 15 minute drive again, back to the base. Right. You are working in Akron. Um, we need to find a median spot if we're going to do this. Right. We'll make this marriage work. So we found Worcester, found a beautiful house, rented it, and I was working at the base, and she was doing her thing at the hospital. So that happened in, uh, we, we got to Worcester in April of 18. Gotcha. April of 18. Um. After about six months of being at the base, guess what started happening? I'm like, God, I made a mistake. Right. This sucks. I'm like, I, I can't believe this. You know, I was a federal agent. I still had my credentials. I just obviously couldn't enforce the law. I'm like, what am I going to do? So I started looking at federal careers again. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to get, find something local. Anybody, yes. And anybody who's probably listening to this are like, well, no wonder you're divorced now because like you just wouldn't stop. It's like, well, yeah, because I don't like being comfortable. Right. Emily very much so wanted the comfortable life and I just couldn't provide that. Right. So I went, the one thing I set myself on that I really wanted to do at least reevaluating was I'm like, okay, well I'm in the air force. Obviously it gets on the tractor beam keeps pulling me back here. I'm like, I'll just be go special, be a special agent in the air force. They have their own investigators. He goes, I know NCIS. Right. That's a legit thing. Right. Like Navy has their own criminal investigators. Right. That's not just a TV show. Well, every branch has that. Right. right? <laughs> OSI air force office of special investigations. Same thing. So I applied. I actually got offered an interview cause I deployed with one of the, I was, I was, I shouldn't say deployed with, I was in the same, uh, deployed region as one of the OSI gotcha. uh, agents. And I, I knew him from my first deployment. I reached out to him. He's like, dude, you're an agent now, blah, blah, blah. Like, let me help you out. Let's get this rolling. So their, their uh, headquarters is in Quantico. So I traveled to Quantico over the summer of 18, um, interviewed, um, did really well. I thought <laughs> got back, got declined. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Even though I was an agent, even though I had criminal investigations experience, even though I had arrests, even though right. I had... But you're yeah. a shoe in at that point. Yeah, right. You exactly. Think? So I kind of I kind of uh, missed that. Um, I, I misguided, not misguided, what I want to say. Um, 
maybe got overconfident with that one. But even during the interview, I kind of realized I'm like, this isn't something I want to do, which was good. You know what I mean? Right. So I had to have a long talk with myself about where am I going to be in life? What do I want out of life? I'm, I'm not happy. Right. I'm happy in my marriage now. We figured things out and we're here now. And obviously we still had bumps and stuff like that. There's always a part of me that's like, you know, you could still go do the CIA thing. You know, you could still right. go run away and do that. You got plenty of experience. Well, you could still go do this, could still go do that. I'm like, what's the one thing that always centers me? What's the one thing that always grounds me? What's the one thing that I have truly a passionate about? That's fitness. That's one thing that has never changed throughout this whole journey is fitness. Right. Physical fitness, mental fitness, right? It's even harder than the physical part. Yeah. And the mental fitness is something I really focused on because I was just telling Ant during that technical break that we had um, during that intermission. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've kept a journal since I was in high school, but really middle school. I write down everything. I keep it digitally or I keep it in a notebook. Right. I've thrown a lot of journals away because I'm afraid to, I was afraid to go back to that. You know what I mean? Um, and I tell you, I bring this with me all the time. Right. Um, Our past can be a scary thing. It is. And you know what? It's, it's really hard to go back and then start to read those things, like where your mind was at. Right. But that's one thing I've always kept constant was like mental and physical strength is, is bar none the most important thing to me. So I was like, how can I affect others to the same effect that I still wanted like back when I was in school? Um, because I had my own reputation now as an adult. You know what I mean? I have friends. Like I got a you know, good social group. I was like, personal trainer, man. And, you know, when I pitch that to family members and friends and stuff like that, when you find something you truly love, and it's so unfortunate that most commonly the people who don't believe in you are going to be the, the ones closest to you because they feel they see what's best for you. Yeah. You know, when I said I was going to be a personal trainer, the reactions that I got to people who I've served with, people who I've known for years, it was like a disappointed father sigh. It's like, oh, really? You want to do that? <laughs> That's right. literally what it was. And I'm like, excuse me, fitness mental and physical has always grounded me right how, it, how do you think i got here how right. do you what do you think i did the day after my wife told me she cheated on me i marched my ass to the gym and i hit that bag i used to box i boxed for 10 years i hit that bag for hours right like as long as this podcast hours <laughs> yeah oh i think that's a piece that you know People think of as, you know, oh, they go to the gym, they work out, your physical fitness, this, that, whatever. And, and no. it gets lost on, I think that's something special too. It gets, the trainers lose that aspect yeah. of, they think it's, oh, it's just there, we're just working on the body. And no. that's it. No. But to work on the body, you have to work on the mind. Yes. You know, and to properly go in, and even to properly go in and lift, you have to have your mental state in the right spot yeah. and to be able to con that mind muscle connection. Yes, is absolutely. It? So I think that's a kind of a, and really that mind spirit connection, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You're like, I, like I said, I'm not really a, a religious person, but there's one thing that I always do believe in. And that's me every time I always believe in me. If there's not anything left in this world, then that means that I'm not around. I always believe in me. People say I have nothing left to live for. You've got yourself to live for. Right. I want to be like this. I want to be like that. No, you want to be like you. That's what I'm about. That's what I wanted to instill in people. And when I, through my life, I've had these conversations with people like as young as 13, like adults, <laughs> like have come to me for guidance. <laughs> it's so weird. I've had such a weird life thus far. Like, I've literally had like my parents' friends and like my, my brother's friends, stuff like that, like whether it's message me or talk to me in person, or whatever. And I'm just like, y you are the most powerful person in the world because you are the world. You're it. Like you are living in your, the way you know the world right. is through your lens. Like that's it, man. Yeah. Like, everything you do. And every, I, you know what, man, I've been called a lot of names. I've been freaking spat on shit on my whole life, man. Call me selfish, call me whatever. But it's like, dude, at the end of the day, it really is all about you. 
Like you can't control any, yeah. anything else. Except Everyone's like, well, well, don't you want to be a good citizen? Well, to be a good citizen, you have to be a good person first. And a good person means knowing yourself first. Amen. Don't you want to be a good father? Well, yeah. I have to be good myself first, though, before yeah. I can be a good father. Don't you want to be a good businessman? Don't you care about other people? You're so selfish. No. I, yeah, first of all, yeah, I am selfish because how yeah. am I supposed to instill that into other people without knowing and loving myself first and knowing myself? Right. You know, knowing ourselves is the hardest person in the world. That's what Matthew McConaughey used to say. He's, he said during his speech, uh, graduation speech, he said, the hardest person to find out and to understand is ourselves. Because how in the hell are you supposed to love anybody, understand anybody else, if you can't even figure yourself out? Yep. Holy moly. Yep. And you're going to sit there and talk to me about and give me advice or tear me apart when you can't even sit there and say that you love the person in the mirror? That's sad, man. And there's a lot of people in that situation. There's a lot of people. And we've, yeah. you know, we've talked about this, and I've said it you know, throughout my life. It's you know, even with people trying to change. Yeah. You know, you, you, that person, you know, whether it be a, a drug addict or this, yeah. that, whatever, that person's got to want it. Mm -hmm. And that person's got to face themselves. Absolutely. No one else is going to make them change. No one else is going to make them do anything. Mm -hmm. No one's going to make you be a good person. Yeah. You got to do it. Inspiration and motivation can be there. But the moment that you turn, you turn that on the inside is when it's going to make the difference. Yeah. It's hard though. It is. It's, rough. it's very hard. It's a daily, <laughs> it's a daily consistent second millisecond grind to keep your head in that headspace. And people are like, well, that's exhausting. Life is exhausting, dude. You're damn right. That's why you die at the end. Yeah. Wow. I never, right. never heard it put like that. <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to be a personal trainer. So I studied. I went on the National Academy of Sports Medicine website, and I'm like, I want to do this. So at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, um, when I moved back to Worcester, everywhere I go, I always find two things right away. That's a gym and a good barber. It's always the first two things. Groceries will figure themselves out. We've got <laughs> Amazon freaking delivers them. So it's like, <laughs> that's easy. You know what I mean? Farmer's markets, it's easy. Gym and a barber, two things I need. So I found the gym, I found Primal Fitness, owned by Craig Noletti. Right. When I signed up there, it was very much so, C.T. Fletcher, as many people know, huge, huge, huge inspiration for me in life. And The Rock, too. You know, Iron Paradise, man. That's what it's all about. I've always worked out in corporate-style gyms or in the woods, <laughs> literally. Trail running, climbing up trees. That's what I did. Getting dirty and mucky and nasty. That's, that's what I do. Right. So I get to Primal Fitness. I meet Craig. <laughs> Craig's got his own personality. Yes, he know? does. And he's very much I so just... He's kind of, yeah, he's Craig. Him. There's yep. no way to describe him. Yep. And I meet him. And I'm just like, yeah, man. I'm like, I was hoping I could just check out the gym or whatever. He's like, yeah, sure. Here's your membership. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I walk into the gym. And, do you remember Old Primal? Uh, yeah, I absolutely do. You know those flags that hang out there? Mm -hmm. I hung those flags. Oh, there. no kidding. I did. I washed them, by the way, just a couple of months ago. They probably needed it. Oh, my God. <laughs> black. I remember. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I. I remember when I joined your gym recently, yeah. um, you know, I remember walking through there and I told Cassie, I was like looking around, I looked up on the wall. I was like, yeah. wow, I forgot. Like, yeah, I hung those up there. Yeah. I'm like, wow. It's just, it's, it's a small, weird, weird, small world that always comes yeah. full circle. Yeah, man. So when I walked in there, you remember when you walked in that first hallway, you're like, Am I going to get killed? <laughs> <laughs> is this a haunted Have house? Have you ever been in Primal Fitness? Well, I am not. Oh, that's too bad. You know, my goal is to actually build a heritage wall, kind of like how the military does like a heritage hall. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I want to build a heritage wall in our little atrium there. I've been saying that for like a year, though, so I better get on it. Yeah, sounds um, like it. But it's going to happen. It's still in my notebook. It ain't going anywhere until I do it. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. doesn't matter what it is. It's the timeline. If I say I'm going to go to the moon and I truly mean it, then I'm going to study my ass off. I'm going to be an astronaut, and my ass is going to land on the moon. That's just the way it is. Unless you think that the moon landing was faked. <laughs> I can't speak to that. <laughs> uh, see, Tony, the, the earth is flat. Aliens are real. The moon landing didn't happen. And the sun revolves around us. Yes. So, um, yeah, so when I walked into Primal, I was like, man, this place is dirty and dungy. But it was awesome. I loved it. Because it was, it was very much so the atmosphere that I needed right. when I came back. I mean, it was just it was just nasty, man. We had garage doors and rusty weights and everything. I'm like, man, this is this is actually kind yeah. of my drive. I, I'm like, I very much so maybe finding a new appreciation for fitness, even though I've loved it my whole life. Um, 
it's well, that old school yeah. barbell gym yeah, feel. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So when I finally decided to be a personal trainer, I studied and studied and studied, and I got my certification. Um, I was like, okay, now what am I going to do with this? I'm like, well, you know, I could stay at the gym, or I could stay at the, uh, I could stay at the base, and just personal train people on the side and just kind of pursue that passion. And it was at that point where I'm like, man, I'm I'm making a leap here, like this is huge. Like if I decide to do this, like, am I going to reenlist in the military? Am I going to go, am I going to become an officer after all this? Like what's going to happen with this? So you want to talk about things happening for a reason. Obviously a lot of the things in my life happen for a reason, um, whether you believe in religion or not. Like right. I truly do think that things happen for a reason. Um, the day after I, I got approved for my certification, I went up to, they call it the operations counter. So I went to the operations counter. It's like where all the, air traffic control and everything like that communications are and stuff. And I was talking to my buddy, Dave, uh, Dave strong. And, uh, he's like, Hey, what's primal fitness. And I'm like, that's a really specifically odd question. He, he doesn't live in Worcester. I'm like, that's my, that's my gym actually. And Sheila prior, I don't know if you know her or not. She's, she's at the base. She's at the base for like a super long time. He's like, Sheila just shared a thing on Facebook, which I didn't have at the time. Um, for my own personal reasons, right? You know, working in it. Well, yeah, we'll go into that because I want to talk about yeah. it. not. We don't do that today. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. we can get that some yeah, other yeah, time yeah. too. Yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. That oh, my, oh my god, the leap I had to make on social media. <laughs> yeah. I still feel so awkward having it. <laughs> and people are like, "Oh, you're so natural at it." That's how everybody talks. By the way, everybody, talk, everybody <laughs> talks. talks like everybody talks like my mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, "Oh, but you're so good," and blah blah blah, and all this. Now that's like a gay Mexican. I'm sorry. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with being a gay Mexican. No. I'm just saying. Like, hey, fiesta. <laughs> so, uh, but no, um, yeah, she's like, she just shared a post that gym's going up for sale. And I was like, it was almost like the world went, like, got it, like, it. it was like, Steve just entered a new universe <laughs> and multiverse. Oh, uh, yeah. And I was like, as quickly as the Naval Academy thing happened, as quickly as that email that I got for being accepted in the military, as quickly as all those things happened in my life, the the cheating, all that stuff, like when all those things happen, it's almost like you kind of like have an out-of-body experience where it's like you see yourself in the third person like, oh, what's 10 years going to look like from this moment? You right. know what I mean? At least that's what happens to me. And I was like, I'm going to buy that gym. I'm going to buy it. It needs so much work. It needs so much love. There's so much potential there. I'm going to buy this gym. And he was selling it for dirt cheap. So <laughs> I pitched it to Emily. I was like, yeah, I don't know about this. Pitched it, pitch it to my parents. Uh, wasn't received well. <laughs> uh, there was... There was one person constant, and I told him I would always give him an honorable mention no matter where it would be, <laughs> whether it's in a book or whether it's in a podcast or whatever. Jake, my buddy Jake Rowley, he was like the only person who believed in me because he was a business person as well. He, he owned a business. Um, he served in the military. He's still in the military. He worked at the unit. He worked at a business. He kind of had it on the side, um, but he also does like lawn care and stuff like that. You want to talk about somebody who just always believed in me. I would just always go down to his office and I would get in trouble so bad. Like I knew people were talking crap every time I'd go down to his office. Like Steve's not doing any work today. He's just hanging out with Jake <laughs> because he believed in me, man. He was the only one. And like people were like, Oh, that it was, it wasn't like, man, that's great. It was like, Oh, that's great. Yeah. There's a huge difference yeah, in the, in crazy the, person in the cadence. Yeah. And the cadence of your voice, you know what I mean? That there, it's very, it was very different. Oh, that's great. So, I sat down with Craig. I, I, I asked to meet with him. I sat down with Craig in March of 19. 19? Is that what it was? I don't know. I don't know either. I didn't say the gym. Mm. <laughs> I don't even remember time frames anymore. Um, maybe 18? I don't know. No, no, it was 19 because a year had passed. Yeah, a year had passed since I was in Worcester. And I was like, um, I was like, hey, man, what? tell me about this gym. He's like, well, you know, I own two CrossFit gyms and I own a gym in Ashland, which he took a, almost a million and a half dollars to build, build. And he's like, it's $25 a month for a membership at Primal Fitness. He had not nearly enough people for it to make sense financially for him. Right. So he was just selling all the assets in there and he wanted to get out of the lease. He just wanted to wash his hands of it. Right. 
there are a lot of other little things that I won't get into just for business ethics. Oh, no, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, a lot of other little things going on. But I was just like, all right, man, well, I'm telling you I'm interested. I said under one condition, though. I'm going to do this voluntarily. I don't want any proceeds of profits. I don't want anything like that. I said, when I, again, when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I made that decision right then and there without anybody's permission. And it was the best feeling in the world. I sat there and <laughs> right. I said, I said, here's what's going to happen. And I told him how it was going to be because I'm like, you want to make this work, right? Because all the other offers he got were crap. And I knew they were. Or it was like people that would be like, that's cool, but you have to beat them. You have to beat them to it. Right. You know what I mean? You have to be serious. It's serious business, right? Mm-hmm. So I said, I will be a manager for you voluntarily. I said, I will double your membership by the end of the se- by the end of the summer. I said, this place needs life. It needs to be renewed. Right. And then it started. <clears throat> I took over and hammers literally started going through the walls. Weights started getting moved around. Equipment started being sold. And it was like it was like a flower that just exploded with life. We not only had doubled, we like doubled in a half the, the membership that was there. I say we, but it was really just me. It's Army of One. I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help from friends. I had a lot of help from my mom and dad. The The amount of renovations that needed to be done there, the amount of cleaning, good Lord, the yeah, amount it's, of cleaning. It's changed. It, it, it is a, it's a warehouse with garage doors. We're talking rodents and bugs and nastiness. Like, dude, <laughs> it, you know, bro, I don't even have to tell you. It was <laughs> yeah. disgusting. And people knew it. Yeah. And when they started seeing changes, they started telling their buddies. Right. And they're like, dude, this is going to be something big. You know what I mean? I'm like, good. Yes. It's not going to be big. It's going to be huge. You know? <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. So I worked. You want to talk about working. I worked probably 20 hours a day. I, would, I was still full-time at the base. So I would go to the base. I was working fives then because the drive wasn't that bad. Monday through Friday, I would get up at around three-ish in the morning. I would do my cardio. I would lift a little bit, get something to eat, go to work, work my shift, come home around 4, 4.30, hang out with the wife. She was working night shift at the time. Make her food, hang out with her for a little bit. Then I'd go train clients at night, and then I'd renovate. And then I'd do it all over again endlessly endlessly over and over and over and over and over again and it built the brand you know what i mean i had my certification i I was training people everything was going really well seeing great results from people but at the same token it's just like this needs to be more you know what i mean we need to we need to move on this we need to (laughs) i don't think i don't think you'll ever stop saying that this needs to be more yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, we need to paint we need more equipment we need more people we need more life we need to renovate you know i mean that it's just it just doesn't stop it doesn't stop. You always have to improve. Always. There's no other option. So because I, I started to see myself again in that third person, I'm like, if I do this, I leave the military because I was ready to leave my contract. Be done. I didn't want to do another six years. Um, so that's what it was. Your, your contract was coming up. I extended for a month. They let me extend for one month, which is very oh, rare. So that sounds super Very rare. rare. Yeah, very rare. Well, technically it's a year, but you can leave at any time because your initial obligation is already fulfilled. So, so I extended and then that was in August because obviously August of 13 is when I signed up six years later, 2019, August of 19, I extended for one month. I, it got to a point where <clears throat> the scales were tipping. So my, my responsibilities at the base were going down. They let me go part-time, which is hilarious. Like I didn't <laughs> even know how that was possible. Um, but they believed in me. So people started to see the, the change. Jake was on my side telling people this was going to happen, man. Right. So then it started to tip. And then I made the decision. I was like, I need to leave. That's what's going to happen. So it was at that point. Um, it was in August of uh, 19 where uh, Craig and I sat down. I'm like, okay, we're setting a hard date for September 1st. I'm going to purchase the gym. We made negotiations. We met with our lawyers. We had a lot of things to figure out, a lot of things that needed to be done, of which were really important things, man. Water heater, getting the ceilings repaired, crazy amount of stuff, crazy amount of work that needed to be done. And I wanted them to do it. I'm like, I'm not going to pay for it. I have you in a corner. I can walk away at any time right now. (laughs) I'm the most powerful person in this situation. Not that I wanted that, but I'm just saying like facts are facts. Facts are facts. (laughs) 
you need somebody to rent your space, you're never going to get it in Worcester. Sorry. It ain't going to happen. Not at what you're asking and not for what you want to do. Right. Greg, what are you going to do with all the equipment if you don't sell it? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Ashland was lot, already... It's Ashland a lot of was, equipment yeah. to shove into a storage and, unit Yeah, somewhere. and that was his fear, was that's what was going to happen. So I was literally the only option because everybody else was like, well, we're not going to meet that offer of what Steve's offering and we're never gonna, we're never gonna have the cash in time. Right. He said he had to do that offered him and they were like, yeah, just give me like 24 hours. <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was asked, I think he was asked like Ted Grant or something to buy the, whole, the oh, gym and all the members. He said, just give me 24 hours. It's like, okay, buddy. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah. Um, so at that time, um, Emily had, my ex-wife had um, a military trip planned. They were going to Germany. And they were going for a training exercise. And um, so I was like, perfect. I'm like, I've been grinding. You've been working so much. I'm like, let's just kind of get to a point where you're doing your thing in the military. I obviously have my space because I need to focus on the gym purchase right now. Like, there's a lot of moving parts. We're like, okay, both of us were like, okay, perfect. This is great. We had uh, scouted out a house. So when she came back, we were going to. We were already scouted out a house. We were ready to go. We had paperwork already filled out. Like a lot of life was happening all at once. So I leave the military in September. She comes back at the end of September. And the night she comes home, um, it was a very busy day. But I was like, hey, I'm like, dude, you just got back from a long ass flight, like over the ocean. You know what I mean? Like, Let's get showered. We'll get a bottle of wine. We'll either we'll either go out and get a bottle of wine, or I'll go get a bottle of wine. We'll cook some dinner, take the dog on a walk, whatever, and just freaking decompress, right? Right. Well, she fell asleep. Totally understandable, right? Totally understandable. I'm like, all right, well, you know, it's working on some stuff on the computer, and I'm like, yeah, she's out. Next morning, she had to go to work the next morning right away. She rolled right back into it. So the God bless her for that. You know what I mean? For rolling right back into work and a nurse's shift. That morning, I was getting things ready for her, and I was like, hey, we need to pick out shingles for our house because the roofer is asking for, you know, what colors we want, right. what type of shingles and everything because we need a new roof on the house that we were getting. And she goes, uh, no, nah, man, I got to leave. And I'm like, for work? I'm like, dude, you don't have to be there for like another half an hour. I'm like, why don't we just, why don't we just kind of figure out like what we want, at least now, give him an idea. She goes, no, nah, man, I want a divorce. Jeez. Just hit you like that, huh? Yeah. Right there in the kitchen. Oh man, yeah. Should have stopped at the gym story. <laughs> she, she already obviously already had it in mind before she came back, know, and we, it was we, already. Do you want to break this up into another episode? Because we totally could. Yeah, I mean we're at uh, yeah we're at, we're at about three and a half hours, so that's that's usually the cap for Jesus. Like the, yeah, it, it goes fast. That yeah, sure yeah. does. Um, next, but that's where you're at now. Primal <laughs> Fitness next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever we figured out. It, yeah, obviously we, we talked about this before. This though. is actually a good part because that that moment, as if all the other f f messed up moments that I've had in my life, I always say like that was the moment. This was the moment. Right. That was the moment. Like you want to talk about like where I'm at now and how I've gotten to the point where I'm at now. That like. New Steve, like Steve out of the military, out of the government, out of wanting to work in intelligence and all that good stuff. Like you want to talk about the moment where I've become who I am now, who people see me now in the public eye. Right. I feel like that would be a good stopping point. We yeah. could we could probably well, do we, you know, we kind of touched last the episode that's going to be coming out soon with um, when we talked with Mike Manchek. Yeah. You know, we talked about the stories and sometimes you just got to start over and you yeah. know, maybe it's. Yeah, maybe it's just another chapter. Yeah, for yeah, sure, man. It's a new I'm totally good. And I, yeah, and like, like we were talking about on the porch too. I'm like, are you sure you want to get into this thing? Because there's a lot <laughs> yeah. to talk. I said, hey, about. we get, we got we got time. You know, I figure even if at, at minimum, if we do 52 of these every year, yeah, we got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But primal fitness, yeah, Worcester, so, Ohio. Yeah, you want anything you want to. You're, if you somebody know. made it this far and they and they're just now hearing about primal fitness like thank you <laughs> well i mean the, yeah, you're, on, you're on instagram yeah. and the facebook yeah and yeah so i am on instagram um 
uh, at superhero steve <laughs> no better way to do that one right um yeah and then we have um a primal fitness ohio um is our uh, instagram for the gym and then we have a training account too which is where we post training videos which oh man i've been getting so much crap about those training videos we'll have to talk about that too <laughs> sounds good oh i can't wait to talk about that <laughs> you have a website people can get a hold of you and... yeah so primal fitness worcester.com um and then i also so i own two companies so i have the gym and then I also have a supplement company. So gotcha, we, all, yeah. we, all, we have uh, handcrafted supplements by yours truly. So um, obviously I work through a distributor. It's not like I'm in the back with like a Butson burner making my own supplements. Right. <laughs> 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 breaking bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it literally wouldn't surprise me one bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you could buy bulk supplements, I guess, and just mix it up in the back and put some Crystal Light flavoring in it, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that's me, and then um, I'll also cap it with you know this is this is very much so a starting point for me to kind of get into uh, what I'm going to be doing for personal branding um, is motivational, inspirational speaking tours. Oh. Um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and drop that mic right here. Nice. So we'll that's, keep us keep us posted. Yeah, I will for sure. Um, I've already been offered to kind of speak at a few different companies. Um, I'm also a coach too, so I, I coach uh, two sports teams, uh, the Ritman High uh, Ritman Schools. I'm the head of strength and conditioning there. And then I also do uh, strength and conditioning for the Worcester Oilers hockey team. Um, so, man of many things. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so. Well, thanks for coming, man. Yeah, yeah it's my look, pleasure. Look I'm, forward. I'm looking forward to the next, uh, the next part. <laughs> <laughs> Parts. I guess I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> what are you looking forward to? I'm looking forward to talking about my divorce and how I was homeless and <laughs> how I started a business with nobody. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> oh, so uh, good. Yeah, uh, well, hopefully that'll make people want to tune in again. There you so. go. There we go. And we'll uh, talk to you next time. All right, sweet. Thanks, Awesome. Man. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does go fast.